The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzy. Chapter One Paris, September seventeen ninety two. A surging, seething, murmuring crowd of beings that are human only in name, for to the eye and ear they seem naught but savage creatures, animated by vile passions and by the lust of vengeance and of hate. The hour, some little time before sunset, and the place, the West Barricade, at the very spot where, a decade later, a proud tyrant raised an undying monument to the nation's glory and his own vanity. During the greater part of the day, the guillotine had been kept busy at its ghastly work. All that France had boasted of in the past centuries, of ancient names and blue blood, had paid toll to her desire for liberty and for fraternity. The carnage had only ceased at this late hour of the day, because there were other more interesting sights for the people to witness. A little while before the final closing of the barricades for the night. And so the crowd rushed away from the Place de la Greve, and made for the various barricades in order to watch this interesting and amusing sight. It was to be seen every day, for those aristos were such fools. They were traitors to the people, of course, all of them, men, women, and children, who happened to be descendants of the great men who, since the Crusades, had made the glory of France, her old noblesse. Their ancestors had oppressed the people, had crushed them under the scarlet heels of their dainty buckled shoes, and now the people had become the rulers of France, and crushed their former masters, not beneath their heel, for they went shoeless mostly in these days, but a more effectual weight, the knife of the guillotine. And daily, hourly, the hideous instrument of torture claimed its many victims, old men, young women, tiny children, until the day when it would finally demand the head of a king and of a beautiful young queen. But this was as it should be. Were not the people now the rulers of France? Every aristocrat was a traitor, as his ancestors had been before him. For two hundred years now the people had sweated and toiled and starved to keep a lustful court in lavish extravagance. Now the descendants of those who had helped to make those courts brilliant had to hide for their lives, to fly, if they wished to avoid the tardy vengeance of the people. And they did try to hide, and tried to fly. That was just the fun of the whole thing. Every afternoon, before the gates closed, and the market carts went out in procession by the various barricades, some fool of an aristo endeavoured to evade the clutches of the Committee of Public Safety. In various disguises, under various pretexts, they tried to slip through the barriers, which were so well guarded by citizen soldiers of the Republic. Men in women's clothes, women in male attire, children disguised in beggars' rags. There were some of all sorts. ci devant counts, marquises, even dukes, who wanted to fly from France, reach England or some other equally accursed country, and there try to rouse foreign feelings against the glorious revolution, or to raise an army in order to liberate the wretched prisoners in the temple, who had once called themselves sovereigns of France. But they were nearly always caught at the barricades. Sergeant Bibot, especially at the West Gate, had a wonderful nose for sending an aristo in the most perfect disguise. Then, of course, the fun began. Bibot would look at his prey as a cat looks upon the mouse, play with him, sometimes for quite a quarter of an hour, pretend to be hoodwinked by the disguise, by the wigs and other bits of theatrical make-up which hid the identity of a ci devant noble marquise or count. Oh, Bibot had a keen sense of humour and it was well worth hanging round that west barricade, in order to see him catch an aristo in the very act of trying to flee from the vengeance of the people. Sometimes Bibot would let his prey actually out by the gates, allowing him to think for the space of two minutes at least, that he really had escaped out of Paris, and might even manage to reach the coast of England in safety. But Bibot would let the unfortunate wretch walk about ten metres toward the open country, then he would send two men after him, and bring him back, stripped of his disguise. Oh, that was extremely funny! For as often as not, the fugitive would prove to be a woman, some proud marchioness, who looked terribly comical when she found herself in Bibot's clutches, after all, and knew that a summary trial would await her the next day, and after that, the fond embrace of Madame la Guillotine. No wonder that on this fine afternoon in September the crowd round Bibot's gate was eager and excited. The lust of blood grows with its satisfaction. There is no satiety. The crowd had seen a hundred noble heads fall beneath the guillotine to-day. 
It wanted to make sure that it would see another hundred fall on the morrow. Bibor was sitting on an overturned and empty cask close by the gate of the barricade. A small detachment of citoyen soldiers was under his command. The work had been very hot lately. Those cursed aristos were becoming terrified and tried their hardest to slip out of Paris. Men, women, and children whose ancestors, even in remote ages, had served those traitorous Bourbons, were all traitors themselves and right food for the guillotine. Every day Bibot had had the satisfaction of unmasking some fugitive royalists and sending them back to be tried by the Committee of Public Safety, presided over by that good patriot citoyen Fouquier Tanville. Robespierre and Danton had both commended Bibot for his zeal, and Bibot was proud of the fact that he, on his own initiative, had sent at least fifty aristos to the guillotine. But to day all the sergeants in command at the various barricades had had special orders. Recently, a very great number of aristos had succeeded in escaping out of France and in reaching England safely. There were curious rumours about these escapes. They had become very frequent and singularly daring. The people's minds were becoming strangely excited about it all. Sergeant Grospierre had been sent to the guillotine for allowing a whole family of aristos to slip out of the north gate under his very nose. It was asserted that these escapes were organized by a band of Englishmen whose daring seemed to be unparalleled, and who, from sheer desire to meddle in what did not concern them, spent their spare time in snatching away lawful victims destined for Madame la Guillotine. These rumors soon grew in extravagance. There was no doubt that this band of meddlesome Englishmen did exist. Moreover, they seemed to be under the leadership of a man whose pluck and audacity were almost fabulous. Strange stories were afloat of how he and those aristos whom he rescued became suddenly invisible as they reached the barricades and escaped out of the gates by sheer supernatural agency. No one had seen these mysterious Englishmen. As for their leader, he was never spoken of, save with a superstitious shudder. Citoyen Fouquier Tanville would, in the course of the day, receive a scrap of paper from some mysterious source. Sometimes he would find it in the pocket of his coat. At others, it would be handed to him by someone in the crowd, whilst he was on his way to the sitting of the Committee of Public Safety. The paper always contained a brief notice that the band of meddlesome Englishmen were at work, and it was always signed with a device drawn in red, a little star-shaped flower, which we in England call the Scarlet Pimpernel. Within a few hours of the receipt of this impudent notice, the citoyen of the Committee of Public Safety would hear that so many royalists and aristocrats had succeeded in reaching the coast, and were on their way to England in safety. The guards at the gates had been doubled. The sergeants in command had been threatened with death, whilst liberal rewards were offered for the capture of these daring and impudent Englishmen. There was a sum of five thousand francs promised to the man who laid hands on the mysterious and elusive Scarlet Pimpernel. Every one felt that Bibot would be that man, and Bibot allowed that belief to take firm root in everybody's mind. And so, day after day, people came to watch him at the West Gate, so as to be present when he laid hands on any fugitive aristo, who perhaps might be accompanied by that mysterious Englishman. Bah! he said to his trusted corporal. Citoyen Grospierre was a fool. Had it been me now at that North Gate last week? Citoyen Bibot spat on the ground to express his contempt for his comrade's stupidity. "'How did it happen, Citoyen?' asked the corporal. "'Grospierre was at the gate, keeping good watch,' began Bibot, pompously, as the crowd closed in round him, listening eagerly to his narrative. "'We've all heard of this meddlesome Englishman, this accursed Scarlet Pimpernel. He won't get through my gate, morbleu, unless he be the devil himself. But Grospierre was a fool.' The market carts were going through the gates. There was one laden with casks and driven by an old man with a boy beside him. Grospierre was a bit drunk, but he thought himself very clever. He looked into the casks, most of them at least, and saw they were empty, and let the cart go through. A murmur of wrath and contempt went round the group of ill-clad wretches who crowded round Citoyen Bibot. Half an hour later, continued the sergeant, up comes a captain of the guard with a squad of some dozen soldiers with him. "'Has a car gone through?' he asks of Grospierre breathlessly. "'Yes,' says Grospierre, "'not half an hour ago.' "'And you have let them escape!' shouts the captain furiously. "'You'll go to the guillotine for this, citoyen sergeant. "'That cart held the concealed ci devant Duc de Chaly and all his family.' "'What?' thunders Grospierre aghast. "'Aye, 
"'And the driver was none other than that cursed Englishman, the Scarlet Pimpernel!' A howl of execration greeted this tale. Citoyen Grospierre had paid for his blunder on the guillotine. But what a fool! Oh, what a fool! Bibot was laughing so much at his own tale, that it was some time before he could continue. "'After them, my men!' shouts the captain, he said after a while. "'Remember the reward! After them! They cannot have gone far!' And with that he rushes through the gate, followed by his dozen soldiers. "'But it was too late!' shouted the crowd excitedly. "'They never got them! Curse that Grospierre for his folly! He deserved his fate! Fancy not examining those casks properly!' But these sallies seemed to amuse Citoyen Bibot exceedingly. He laughed until his sides ached, and the tears streamed down his cheeks. "'Nay, nay,' he said at last, "'those aristos weren't in the cart. The driver was not the Scarlet Pimpernel.' "'What? No! The captain of the guard was that damned Englishman in disguise, and every one of his soldiers aristos.' The crowd this time said nothing. The story certainly savoured of the supernatural, and though the Republic had abolished God— it had not quite succeeded in killing the fear of the supernatural in the hearts of the people. Truly that Englishman must be the devil himself. The sun was sinking low down in the west. Bibot prepared himself to close the gates. "'En avant the carts,' he said. Some dozen covered carts were drawn up in a row, ready to leave town, in order to fetch the produce from the country close by for market the next morning. They were mostly well known to Bibot, as they went through his gate twice every day on their way to and from the town. He spoke to one or two of their drivers, mostly women, and was at great pains to examine the inside of the carts. "'You never know,' he would say, "'and I am not going to be caught like that fool Grospierre.' The women who drove the carts usually spent their day on the Place de la Grève, beneath the platform of the guillotine, knitting and gossiping whilst they watched the rows of tumbrils arriving with the victims the reign of terror claimed every day. It was great fun to see the aristos arriving for the reception of Madame la Guillotine and those places close by the platform were very much sought after. Bibot, during the day, had been on duty on the Place. He recognised most of the old hats, tricoteurs, as they were called, who sat there and knitted, whilst head after head fell beneath the knife, and they themselves got quite bespattered with the blood of those cursed aristos. Eh, hey, la mer, said Bibot, to one of those horrible hags, what have you got there? He had seen her earlier in the day, with her knitting and the whip of her cart close beside her. Now she had fastened a row of curly locks to the whip-handle, all colours, from gold to silver, fair to dark, and she stroked them with her huge bony fingers as she laughed at Bibot. "'I made friends with Madame Guillotine's lover,' she said with a coarse laugh. "'He cut these off for me from their heads as they roll down. He has promised me some more to-morrow, but I don't know if I shall be at my usual place.' Ah. "'How is that, la mer?' asked Bibot, who, hardened soldier that he was, could not help shuddering at the awful loathsomeness of this semblance of a woman, with her ghastly trophy on the handle of her whip. "'My grandson has got the smallpox,' she said with a jerk of her thumb towards the inside of her cart. "'Some say it's the plague. If it is, I shan't be allowed to come into Paris to-morrow.' At the first mention of the word smallpox, Bibot had stepped hastily backwards, and when the old hag spoke of the plague, he retreated from her as fast as he could. "'Curse you!' he muttered, whilst the whole crowd hastily avoided the cart, leaving it standing all alone in the midst of the place. The old hag laughed. "'Curse you, citoyen, for being a coward,' she said. "'Bah! What a man to be afraid of sickness! Oh, blow the plague!' Every one was awestruck and silent, filled with horror for the loathsome malady, the one thing which still had the power to arouse terror and disgust in the savage, brutalised creatures. "'Get out with you, and with your plague-stricken brood!' shouted Bibot hoarsely. And with another rough laugh and coarse jest, the old hag whipped up her lean nag and drove her cart out of the gate. This incident had spoiled the afternoon. The people were terrified of these two horrible curses, the two maladies which nothing could cure, and which were the precursors of an awful and lonely death. They hung about the barricades, silent and sullen for a while, eyeing one another suspiciously, avoiding each other as if by instinct, lest the plague lurked already in their midst. Presently, as in the case of Grospierre, a captain of the guard appeared suddenly. But he was known to be Bibot, and there was no fear of his turning out to be a sly Englishman in disguise. "'A cart!' he shouted breathlessly, even before he had reached the gates. "'What cart?' asked Bibot, roughly. "'Driven by an old hag, a covered cart. There were a dozen.' 
"'An old hag who said her son had the plague?' "'Yes.' "'You have not let them go?' "'Oh, blur!' said Bibot, whose purple cheeks had suddenly become white with fear. "'The cart contained the ci devant Comtesse de Tournay and her two children, all of them traitors and condemned to death.' "'And their driver?' muttered Bibot, as a superstitious shudder ran down his spine. "'Sacre tonnerre!' said the captain. "'But it is feared that it was that accursed Englishman himself, the Scarlet Pimpernel.' End of chapter 1「The Scarlet Pimpernel」by Baroness Orzee Chapter 2 Dover – The Fisherman's Rest In the kitchen Sally was extremely busy. Saucepans and frying-pans were standing in rows on the gigantic hearth. The huge stock-pot stood in a corner, and the jack turned with slow deliberation, and presented alternately to the glow every side of a noble sirloin of beef. The two little kitchen-maids bustled around, eager to help, hot and panting, with cotton sleeves well tucked up above the dimpled elbows, and giggling over some private jokes of their own, whenever Miss Sally's back was turned for a moment. And old Jemima, stolid in temper and solid in bulk, kept up a long and subdued grumble, while she stirred the stock-pot methodically over the fire. "'What ho, Sally!' came in cheerful, if none too melodious, accents from the coffee-room close by. "'Lord bless my soul!' exclaimed Sally, with a good-humoured laugh. "'What be they all wanting now, I wonder?' "'Beer, of course,' grumbled Jemima. "'You don't expect Jimmy Pitkin to have done with one tankard, do you?' "'Mr. Harry, he looked uncommon thirsty, too,' simpered Martha, one of the little kitchen-maids, and her beady black eyes twinkled as they met those of her companion, whereupon both started on a round of short and suppressed giggles. Sally looked cross for a moment, and thoughtfully rubbed her hands against her shapely hips. Her palms were itching, evidently, to come in contact with Martha's rosy cheeks. But inherent good humour prevailed, and with a pout and a shrug of the shoulders she turned her attention to the fried potatoes. "'What ho, Sally! Hey, Sally!' and a chorus of pewter mugs, tapped with impatient hands against the oak tables of the coffee-room, accompanied the shouts for mine host's buxom daughter. "'Sally!' shouted a more persistent voice. "'Are you going to be all night with that there beer?' "'I do think father might get the beer for them,' muttered Sally, as Jemima stolidly and without further comment took a couple of foam-crowned jugs from the shelf, and began filling a number of pewter tankards with some of that home-brewed ale for which the fisherman's rest had been famous since the days of King Charles. "'He knows how busy we are in here. Your father is too busy discussing politics with Mr. Empsey to worry yourself about you in the kitchen,' grumbled Jemima under her breath. Sally had gone to the small mirror which hung in a corner of the kitchen, and was hastily smoothing her hair and setting her frilled cap at its most becoming angle over her dark curls. Then she took up the tankards by their handles, three in each strong brown hand, and, laughing, grumbling, blushing, carried them through into the coffee-room. There there was certainly no sign of that bustle and activity which kept four women busy and hot in the glowing kitchen beyond. The coffee-room of the Fisherman's Rest is a show-place now at the beginning of the twentieth century. At the end of the eighteenth, in the year of grace 1792, it had not yet gained the notoriety and importance which a hundred additional years and the craze of the age have since bestowed upon it. Yet it was an old place even then, for the oak rafters and beams were already black with age, as were the panelled seats, with their tall backs, and the long polished tables between, on which innumerable pewter tankards had left fantastic patterns of many-sized rings. In the leaded window high up, a row of pots of scarlet geraniums and blue larkspur gave the bright note of colour against the dull background of the oak. That Mr. Jellyband— landlord of the fisherman's rest at Dover, was a prosperous man, was, of course, clear to the most casual observer. The pewter on the fine old dresses, the brass on the gigantic hearth, shone like silver and gold. The red-tiled floor was as brilliant as the scarlet geranium on the window-sill. This meant that his servants were good and plentiful, that the custom was constant, and of that order which necessitated the keeping up of the coffee-room to a high standard of elegance and order. As Sally came in, laughing through her frowns, and displaying a row of dazzling white teeth, she was greeted with shouts and chorus of applause. "'Why, here's Sally! What ho, Sally! Hurrah for pretty Sally!' "'I thought you'd grown deaf in that kitchen of yours,' muttered Jimmy Pitkin, as he passed the back of his hand across his very dry lips. 
"'All right, all right,' laughed Sally, as she deposited the freshly filled tankards upon the tables. "'Why, what a hurry, to be sure! And is your grandmother a dying, and you wantin' to see the poor soul afore she'm gone? I never seed such a mighty Russian!' A chorus of good-humoured laughter greeted this witticism, which gave the company there present food for many jokes for some considerable time. Sally now seemed in less of a hurry to get back to her pots and pans. A young man with fair curly hair and eager bright blue eyes was engaging most of her attention and the whole of her time, whilst broad witticisms anent Jimmy Pitkin's fictitious grandmother flew from mouth to mouth, mixed with heavy puffs of pungent tobacco smoke. Facing the hearth, his legs wide apart, a long clay pipe in his mouth, stood mine host himself, worthy Mr. Jellyband, landlord of the Fisherman's Rest, as his father had before him, ay, and his grandfather and great-grandfather too, for that matter. Portly in build, jovial in countenance, and somewhat bald of pate, Mr. Jellyband was indeed a typical rural John Bull of those days the days when our prejudiced insularity was at its height, when to an Englishman, be he lord, yeoman, or peasant, the whole of the continent of Europe was a den of immorality, and the rest of the world an unexploited land of savages and cannibals. There he stood, mine worthy host, firm and well set up on his limbs, smoking his long churchwarden, and caring nothing for nobody at home, and despising everybody abroad. He wore the typical scarlet waistcoat, with shiny brass buttons, the corduroy breeches, and the grey worsted stockings and smart buckled shoes that characterised every self-respecting innkeeper in Great Britain in these days. And while pretty motherless Sally had need of four pairs of brown hands to do all the work that fell on her shapely shoulders, worthy Jellyband discussed the affairs of nations with his most privileged guests. The coffee-room, indeed, lighted by two well-polished lamps which hung from the raftered ceiling, looked cheerful and cosy in the extreme. Through dense clouds of tobacco smoke that hung about in every corner, the faces of Mr. Jellyband's customers appeared red and pleasant to look at, and on good terms with themselves, their host, and all the world. From every side of the room, loud guffaws accompanied pleasant, if not highly intellectual, conversation, while Sally's repeated giggles testified to the good use Mr. Harry Waite was making of the short time she seemed inclined to spare him. They were mostly fisher-folk who patronised Mr. Jellyband's coffee-room, but fishermen are known to be very thirsty people. The salt which they breathe in when they are on the sea accounts for their parched throats when on shore. But the fisherman's rest was something more than a rendezvous for these humble folk. The London and Dover coach started from the hostel daily, and passengers who had come across the channel, and those who started for the grand tour, all became acquainted with Mr. Jellyband, his French wines, and his home-brewed ales. It was towards the close of September 1792, and the weather, which had been brilliant and hot throughout the month, had suddenly broken up. For two days torrents of rain had deluged the south of England, doing its level best to ruin what chances the apples and pears and late plums had of becoming really fine, self-respecting fruit. Even now it was beating against the leaded windows and tumbling down the chimney, making the cheerful wood fire sizzle in the hearth. Lud. "'Did you ever see such a wet September, Mr. Jellyband?' asked Mr. Hempseed. He sat in one of the seats inside the hearth, did Mr. Hempseed, for he was an authority and important personage, not only at the Fisherman's Rest, where Mr. Jellyband always made a special selection of him as a foil for political arguments, but throughout the neighbourhood, where his learning and notably his knowledge of the Scriptures was held in the most profound awe and respect.' With one hand buried in the capacious pockets of his corduroys, underneath his elaborately worked, well-worn smock, the other holding his long clay pipe, Mr. Hempseed sat there, looking dejectedly across the room at the rivulets of moisture which trickled down the window-panes. "'No,' replied Mr. Jellyband sententiously, "'I dunno, Mr. Hempseed, as I ever did. And I've been in these parts nigh on sixty years. Aye.' "'You wouldn't recollect the first three years of them sixty, Mr. Jellyband,' quietly interposed Mr. Hempseed. "'I dunno as I ever seed an infant take much note of the weather. Leastways not in these parts, and I've lived here nigh on seventy-five years, Mr. Jellyband.' The superiority of this wisdom was so incontestable that, for the moment, Mr. Jellyband was not ready with his usual flow of argument. "'It do seem more like April than September, don't it?' continued Mr. Hempseed dolefully, as a shower of raindrops fell with a sizzle upon the fire. "'Aye, that it do,' assented the worthy host. "'But then, what can you spec, Mr. Hempseed, I says, with such a government as we've got?' 
Mr. Hempseed shook his head with an infinity of wisdom, tempered by deeply rooted mistrust of the British climate and the British government. "'I don't spec nothing, Mr. Jellyband,' he said. "'Poor folks like us is of no account up there in Lunnon. I knows that, and it's not often as I do complain. But when it comes to such wet weather in September, and all me fruit a rotting and a dying, like the gubtion mother's first born, and doing no more good than they did, poor dears, save a lot more Jews, peddlers and such, with their oranges and such like foreign ungodly fruit, which nobody'd buy if English apples and pears was nicely swelled. As the scriptures say, that's quite right, Mr. Empsey, retorted Jellyband, and as I says, what can you spect? There's all them Frenchy devils over the channel yonder a murdering their king and nobility, and Mr. Pitt and Mr. Fox and Mr. Burke a fighting and a wrangling between them, if we Englishmen should allow them to go on in their ungodly way. Let em murder, says Mr. Pitt. Stop em, says Mr. Burke. And let em murder, says I, and be dem to em, said Mr. Hempseed, emphatically for he had but little liking for his friend Jellyband's political arguments, wherein he always got out of his depth, and had but little chance for displaying those pearls of wisdom which had earned for him so high a reputation in the neighbourhood, and so many free tankards of ale at the fisherman's rest. "'Let a murder,' he repeated again. "'But don't let's have such rain in September, for that is agin the law, and the scriptures, which says, "'Lud, Mr. Harry, how you made me jump!' It was unfortunate for Sally and her flirtation that this remark of hers should have occurred at the precise moment when Mr. Hempseed was collecting his breath, in order to deliver himself one of those scriptural utterances which made him famous, for it brought down upon her pretty head the full flood of her father's wrath. "'Now then, Sally, me girl, now then,' he said, trying to force a frown upon his good-humoured face. "'Stop that foolin' with them young jackanapes, and get on with the work.' "'The work's getting on all right, father.' but Mr. Jellyband was peremptory. He had other views for his buxom daughter, his only child, who would in God's good time become the owner of the fisherman's rest, than to see her married to one of these young fellows who earned but a precarious livelihood with their net. "'Did ye hear me speak, my girl?' he said in that quiet tone, which no one inside the inn dared to disobey. "'Get on with my Lord Tony's supper, for if it ain't the best we can do, and he not satisfied, see what you'll get, that's all.' Reluctantly, Sally obeyed. "'Is you expecting special guests then to-night, Mr. Jellyband?' asked Jimmy Pitkin, in a loyal attempt to divert his host's attention from the circumstances connected with Sally's exit from the room. "'Aye, that I be,' replied Jellyband. "'Friends o' my Lord Tony hisself, dukes and duchesses from over the water yonder, whom the young lord and his friend Sir Andrew Folkes, and the other young noblemen, have helped out of the clutches of them murdering devils.' But this was too much for Mr. Hempseed's querulous philosophy. Yad, he said, "'What do they do that for, I wonder? I don't hold not with interfering in other folks' ways. As the scriptures say—' "'Maybe, Mr. Hempseed, interrupted Jellyband, with biting sarcasm, "'as you're a personal friend of Mr. Pitt, and as you says along with Mr. Fox, "'let a murder, says you.' "'Pardon me, Mr. Jellyband,' feebly protested Mr. Hempseed. "'I don't know as I ever did.' But Mr. Jellyband had at last succeeded in getting upon his favourite hobby-horse, and had no intention of dismounting in any hurry. "'Or maybe you've made friends with some of them French chaps who, they do say, have come over here a purpose to make us Englishmen agree with their murdering ways.' "'I dunno what you mean, Mr. Jellyband,' suggested Mr. Hempseed. "'All I know is—all I know is,' loudly asserted mine host— that there was my friend Peppercorn, who owns the blue-faced boar, and as true and loyal an Englishman as you'd see in the land. And now look at him. He made friends with some of them frog-eaters, obnobbed with them just as if they was Englishmen, and not just a lot of immoral, God-forsaken foreign spies. Well, and what happened? Peppercorn, he now ups and talks of revolutions and liberty, and down with the aristocrats, just like Mr. Hempseed over here. Pardon me, Mr. Jellyband. "'again interposed Mr. Hempseed feebly. "'I dunno as I ever did.' "'Mr. Jellyband had appealed to the company in general, "'who were listening awestruck and open-mouthed "'at the recital of Mr. Peppercorn's defalcations. "'At one table, two customers, "'gentlemen apparently by their clothes, "'had pushed aside their half-finished game of dominoes, "'and had been listening for some time, "'and evidently with much amusement, "'at Mr. Jellyband's international opinions. 
One of them now, with a quiet, sarcastic smile still lurking round the corners of his mobile mouth, turned towards the centre of the room where Mr. Jellyband was standing. "'You seem to think, my honest friend,' he said quietly, "'that these Frenchmen—spies, I think you called them—are mighty clever fellows to have made mincemeat, so to speak, of your friend Mr. Peppercorn's opinions. How did they accomplish that now, think you?' "'Lad, sir, I suppose they talked him over.' Those Frenchies, I've heard it said, I've got the gift of gab, and Miss Remsey, dear, will tell you how it is that they just twist some people round their little finger like. Indeed, and is that so, Mr. Hempseed? inquired the stranger politely. Nay, sir, replied Mr. Hempseed, much irritated, I dunno as I can give you the information you require. Faith, then, said the stranger, let us hope, my worthy host, that these clever spies will not succeed in upsetting your extremely loyal opinions. But this was too much for Mr. Jellyband's pleasant equanimity. He burst into an uproarious fit of laughter, which was soon echoed by those who happened to be in his debt. <laughs> he laughed in every key, did my worthy host, and laughed until his side ached and his eyes streamed. At me! Hark at that! Did you hear him say that they'd be upsetting my opinions, eh? Lord love you, sir! But you do say some queer things. "'Well, Mr. Jellyband,' said Mr. Hempstead, sententiously, "'you know what the scriptures say. "'Let him who stands take heed lest he fall.' "'But then hark ye, Mr. Hempstead,' retorted Jellyband, "'still holding his sides with laughter. "'The scriptures didn't know me. "'Why, I wouldn't so much as drink a glass of ale "'with one of them murdering Frenchmen, "'and nothing would make me change my opinions. "'Why, I've heard it said that them frog-eaters "'can't even speak the king's English.' So, of course, if any of them tried to speak their God-forsaken lingo to me, why, I should spot them directly, see? And forewarned is forearmed, as the saying goes. Ay, my honest friend, assented the stranger cheerfully, I see that you are much too sharp, and a match for any twenty Frenchmen. And here's to your very good health, my worthy host, if you'll do me the honour to finish this bottle of mine with me. I'm sure you're very polite, sir." said Mr. Jellyband, wiping his eyes, which were still streaming with the abundance of his laughter, and I don't mind if I do. The stranger poured out a couple of tankards full of wine, and having offered one to mine host, he took the other himself. "'Loyal Englishmen, as we all are,' he said, whilst the same humorous smile played around the corners of his thin lips, "'loyal, as we are, we must admit that this, at least, is one good thing which comes to us from France.' "'Aye, will none of us deny that, sir?' assented mine host. "'And here's to the best landlord in England, our worthy host, Mr. Jellyband,' said the stranger, in a loud tone of voice. "'Hip, hip! Hurrah!' retorted the whole company present. Then there was a loud clapping of hands, and mugs and tankards made a rattling music upon the tables to the accompaniment of loud laughter at nothing in particular, and of Mr. Jellyband's muttered exclamations. "'Just fancy me being talked over by any godforsaken foreigner! What?' "'I love you, sir, but you do say some queer things.' To which obvious fact the stranger heartily assented. It was certainly a preposterous suggestion that any one could ever upset Mr. Jellyband's firmly rooted opinions, anent the utter worthlessness of the inhabitants of the whole continent of Europe. End of chapter 2《The Scarlet Pimpernel》by Baroness Orzee Chapter 3 the refugees. Feeling in every part of England certainly ran very high at this time against the French and their doings. Smugglers and legitimate traders between the French and the English coasts brought snatches of news from over the water, which made every honest Englishman's blood boil, and made him long to have a good go at those murderers who had imprisoned their king and all his family, subjected the Queen and the royal children to every species of indignity and were even now loudly demanding the blood of the whole Bourbon family, and of every one of its adherents. The execution of the Princesse de Lamballe, Marie Antoinette's young and charming friend, had filled every one in England with unspeakable horror. The daily execution of scores of royalists of good family, whose only sin was their aristocratic name, seemed to cry for vengeance to the whole of civilised Europe. Yet with all that, no one dared to interfere. Burke had exhausted all his eloquence in trying to induce the British government to fight the revolutionary government of France, but Mr. Pitt, 
with characteristic prudence, did not feel that this country was fit yet to embark on another arduous and costly war. It was for Austria to take the initiative. Austria, whose fairest daughter was even now a dethroned queen, imprisoned and insulted by a howling mob. Surely it was not. So argued Mr. Fox, for the whole of England to take up arms, because one set of Frenchmen chose to murder another. As for Mr. Jellyband and his fellow John Bulls, though they looked upon all foreigners with withering contempt, they were royalist and anti revolutionist to a man, and at this present moment were furious with Pitt for his caution and moderation, although they naturally understood nothing of the diplomatic reasons which guided that great man's policy. By now Sally came running back, very excited and very eager. The joyous company in the coffee room had heard nothing of the noise outside, but she had spied a dripping horse and rider who had stopped at the door of the fisherman's rest, and while the stable boy ran forward to take charge of the horse, pretty Miss Sally went to the front door to greet the welcome visitor. I think I see my Lord Antony's horse out in the yard, father, she said as she ran across the coffee room. But already the door had been thrown open from outside, and the next moment an arm, covered in drab cloth and dripping with the heavy rain, was round pretty Sally's waist, while a hearty voice echoed along the polished rafters of the coffee room. Ay, and bless your brown eyes for being so sharp, my pretty Sally, said the man who had just entered, whilst worthy Mr. Jellyband came bustling forward, eager, alert, and fussy, as became the advent of one of the most favoured guests of his hostel. Lord, I protest, Sally, added Lord Antony, as he deposited a kiss on Miss Sally's blooming cheeks. But you are growing prettier and prettier every time I see you. And my honest friend Jellyband here have hard work to keep the fellows off that slim waist of yours. What say you, Mr. Waite? Mr. Waite, torn between his respect for my lord and his dislike of that particular type of joke, only replied with a doubtful grunt. Lord Antony Dewhurst, one of the sons of the Duke of Exeter, was in those days a very perfect type of a young English gentleman, tall, well set up, broad of shoulders, and merry of face. His laughter rang loudly wherever he went. A good sportsman, a lively companion, a courteous, well bred man of the world, with not too much brains to spoil his temper, he was a universal favourite in London drawing rooms or in the coffee rooms of village inns. At the fisherman's rest, every one knew him, for he was fond of a trip across to France, and always spent a night under worthy Mr. Jellyband's roof on his way there or back. He nodded to Waite, Pitkin, and the others, as he at last released Sally's waist, and crossed over to the hearth to warm and dry himself. As he did so, he cast a quick, somewhat suspicious glance at the two strangers, who had quietly resumed their game of dominoes, and for a moment a look of deep earnestness, even of anxiety, clouded his jovial young face. But only for a moment. The next he turned to Mr. Hempseed, who was respectfully touching his forelock. Well, Mr. Hempseed, and how is the fruit? Badly, my lord, badly, replied Mr. Hempseed dolefully. But what can you spect with this year government favouring them rascals over in France who would murder their king and all their nobility? Odds life, retorted Lord Antony. So they would, honest Hempseed. At least those they can get hold of, worse luck. But we have got some friends coming here to night who at any rate have evaded their clutches. It almost seemed when the young man said these words, as if he threw a defiant look towards the quiet strangers in the corner. "'Thanks to you, my lord, and to your friends, so I've heard it said,' said Mr. Jellyband. But in a moment Lord Antony's hand fell warningly on mine host's arm. "'Hush!' he said peremptorily, and instinctively once again looked towards the strangers. "'Oh, Lord, love ye. They're all right, my lord,' retorted Jellyband. "'Don't you be afraid. I wouldn't have spoken, only I knew we were among friends.' That gentleman over there is as true and loyal a subject of King George as you are yourself, my lord, saving your presence. He is but lately arrived in Dover, and is setting down in business in these parts. In business? Faith, then, it must be as an undertaker, for I vow I never beheld a more rueful countenance. Nay, my lord, I believe that the gentleman is a widower, which no doubt would account for the melancholy of his bearing. But he is a friend, nevertheless. I'll vouch for that. And you will own, my lord, that who should judge a face better than the landlord of a popular inn? Oh, that's all right, then, if we're among friends, said Lord Antony, who evidently did not care to discuss the subject with his host. But tell me, you have no one else staying here, have you? No one, my lord, and no one coming, either. Leastways— Leastways? No one your lordship would object to, I know. Who is it? Well, my lord, Sir Percy Blakeney and his lady will be here presently— but they ain't a-goin' to stay. Lady Blakeney? 
queried Lord Antony, in some astonishment. "'Aye, my lord. Sir Percy's skipper was here just now. He says that my lady's brother is crossing over to France to-day in the daydream, which is Sir Percy's yacht, and Sir Percy and my lady will come with him as far as here to see the last of him. It don't put you out, do it, my lord?' "'No, no, it doesn't put me out, friend. Nothing will put me out unless that supper is not the very best which Miss Sally can cook, and which has ever been served in the fisherman's rest.' "'You need have no fear of that, my lord,' said Sally, who all this while had been busy setting the table for supper, and very gay and inviting it looked, with a large bunch of brilliantly coloured dahlias in the centre, and the bright pewter goblets and blue china about. "'How many shall I lay for, my lord?' Five places, pretty Sally. But let the supper be enough for ten at least. Our friends will be tired, and, I hope, hungry. As for me, I vow I could demolish a baron of beef to-night.' "'Here they are, I do believe,' said Sally excitedly, as a distant clatter of horses and wheels could now be distinctly heard, drawing rapidly nearer. There was a general commotion in the coffee-room. Every one was curious to see my Lord Antony's swell friends from over the water. Miss Sally cast one or two quick glances at the little bit of mirror which hung on the wall, and worthy Mr. Jellyband bustled out in order to give the first welcome himself to his distinguished guests. Only the two strangers in the corner did not participate in the general excitement. They were calmly finishing their game of dominoes, and did not even look once towards the door. "'Straight ahead, Comtesse, the door on your right,' said a pleasant voice outside. "'Aye, there they are, all right enough,' said Lord Antony, joyfully. "'Off with you, my pretty Sally, and see how quick you can dish up the soup.' The door was thrown wide open, and preceded by Mr. Jellyband, who was profuse in his bows and welcomes, a party of four, two ladies and two gentlemen, entered the coffee-room. "'Welcome!' "'Welcome to old England,' said Lord Antony effusively, as he came eagerly forward with both hands outstretched towards the newcomers. "'Ah! You are Lord Antony Duhest, I think?' said one of the ladies, speaking with a strong foreign accent. "'At your service, madame,' he replied, as he ceremoniously kissed the hands of both the ladies, then turned to the men and shook them both warmly by the hand. Sally was already helping the ladies to take off their travelling cloaks, and both turned, with a shiver, towards the brightly blazing hearth. There was a general movement among the company in the coffee-room. Sally had bustled off to her kitchen, whilst Jellyband, still profuse with his respectful salutations, arranged one or two chairs around the fire. Mr. Hempseed, touching his forelock, was quietly vacating the seat in the hearth. Every one was staring curiously, yet deferentially, at the foreigners. "'Ah, monsieur, what can I say?' said the elder of the two ladies, as she stretched a pair of fine, aristocratic hands to the warmth of the blaze, and looked with unspeakable gratitude, first at Lord Antony, then at one of the young men who had accompanied her party, and who was busy divesting himself of his heavy caped coat. "'Only that you are glad to be in England, Comtesse,' replied Lord Antony, "'and that you have not suffered too much from your trying voyage. "'Indeed, indeed, we are glad to be in England,' she said, while her eyes filled with tears, and we have already forgotten all that we have suffered. Her voice was musical and low, and there was a great deal of calm dignity, and of many sufferings nobly endured, marked in the handsome, aristocratic face, with its wealth of snowy white hair dressed high above the forehead, after the fashion of the times. "'I hope my friend, Sir Anthony Foulkes, proved an entertaining travelling companion, madame?' "'Ah, indeed! Sir Andrew was kindness itself!' How could my children and I ever show enough gratitude to you, oh, monsieur? Her companion, a dainty girlish figure, childlike and pathetic in its look of fatigue and of sorrow, had said nothing as yet, but her eyes, large, brown, and full of tears, looked up from the fire and sought those of Sir Andrew Foulkes, who had drawn near to the hearth and to her. Then, as they met his, which were fixed with unconcealed admiration upon the sweet face before him, a thought of warmer colour rushed up to her pale cheeks. "'So this is England,' she said, as she looked round with childlike curiosity at the great hearth, the oak rafters, and the yokels with their elaborate smocks and jovial rubicund British countenances. "'A bit of it, mademoiselle,' replied Sir Andrew, smiling, "'but all of it at your service.' The young girl blushed again, but this time a bright smile, fleet and sweet, illumined her dainty face. She said nothing— and Sir Andrew, too, was silent. Yet those two young people understood one another, as young people have a way of doing all the world over, and have done since the world began. "'But I say, supper!' here broke in Lord Antony's jovial voice. "'Supper, honest Jellyband! Where is that pretty wench of yours, and the dish of soup? 
"'Zooks, man, while you stand there gaping at the ladies, they will faint with hunger. "'One moment, one moment, my lord,' said Jellyband, as he threw open the door that led to the kitchen, and shouted lustily, "'Sally! Hey, Sally there! Are you ready, my girl?' Sally was ready, and the next moment she appeared in the doorway, carrying a gigantic tureen, from which rose a cloud of steam and an abundance of savoury odour. "'Odd's life, supper at last!' ejaculated Lord Antony merrily, as he gallantly offered his arm to the Comtesse. "'May I have the honour? he added ceremoniously, as he led her towards the supper-table. There was a general bustle in the coffee-room. Mr. Hempseed and most of the yokels and fisher-folk had gone to make way for the quality, and to finish smoking their pipes elsewhere. Only the two strangers stayed on, quietly and unconcernedly playing their game of dominoes, and sipping their wine, whilst at another table Harry Waite, who was fast losing his temper, watched pretty Sally bustling round the table. She looked a very dainty picture of English rural life, and no wonder that the susceptible young Frenchman could scarce take his eyes off her pretty face. The Vicomte de Tournay was scarce nineteen, a beardless boy, on whom terrible tragedies which were being enacted in his own country had made but little impression. He was elegantly and even foppishly dressed, and once safely landed in England he was evidently ready to forget the horrors of the Revolution in the delights of English life. Pardi, if this is England, he said, as he continued to ogle Sally with marked satisfaction, I am of it satisfied. It would be impossible, at this point, to record the exact exclamation which escaped through Mr. Harry Waite's clenched teeth. Only respect for the quality, and notably for my Lord Antony, kept his marked disapproval of the young foreigner in check. Nay, but this is England, you abandoned young reprobate interposed Lord Antony with a laugh, and do not, I pray, bring your loose foreign ways into this most moral country. Lord Antony had already sat down at the head of the table with the Comtesse on his right. Jellyband was bustling around, filling glasses and putting chairs straight. Sally waited, ready to hand round the soup. Mr. Harry Waite's friends had at last succeeded in taking him out of the room, for his temper was growing more and more violent under the Vicomte's obvious admiration for Sally. Suzanne came in stern, commanding accents from the rigid Comtesse. Suzanne blushed again. She had lost count of time and of place, whilst she had stood beside the fire, allowing the handsome young Englishman's eyes to dwell upon her sweet face, and his hand, as if unconsciously, to rest upon hers. Her mother's voice brought her back to reality once more, and with a submissive, "'Yes, mamma," she took her place at the supper-table. End of chapter 3 the Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzy. Chapter four The League of the Scarlet Pimpernel They all looked a merry, even a happy party, as they sat round the table. Sir Andrew Folkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst, two typical, good looking, well born and well bred Englishmen of that year of grace, seventeen ninety two, and the aristocratic French comtesse, with her two children, who had just escaped from such dire perils, and found a safe retreat at last on the shores of protecting England. In the corner the two strangers had apparently finished their game. One of them arose, and standing with his back to the merry company at the table, he adjusted with much deliberation his large triple-caped coat. As he did so, he gave one quick glance all around him. Every one was busy laughing and chatting, and he murmured the words, "'All safe.' His companion, then, with the alertness born of long practice, slipped on to his knees in a moment, and the next had crept noiselessly under the oak bench. The stranger, then, with a loud, "'Good night!' quietly walked out of the coffee-room. Not one of those at the supper-table had noticed this curious and silent manoeuvre. But when the stranger finally closed the door of the coffee-room behind him, they all instinctively sighed a sigh of relief. "'Alone at last,' said Lord Antony jovially. Then the young Vicomte de Tournay rose, glass in hand, and with the graceful affection peculiar to the times, he raised it aloft, and said in broken English, "'To His Majesty George III of England, God bless him for his hospitality to us all, poor exiles from France.' "'His Majesty the King.' echoed Lord Antony and Sir Andrew, as they drank loyally to the toast. "'To His Majesty King Louis of France,' added Sir Andrew, with solemnity, "'may God protect him, and give him victory over his enemies.' Every one rose and drank this toast in silence. The fate of the unfortunate King of France, then a prisoner of his own people, seemed to cast a gloom even over Mr. Jellyband's pleasant countenance. 
"'And to Monsieur le Comte de Tournay de Basserive,' said Lord Antony merrily, "'may we welcome him in England before many days are over.' "'Ah, monsieur,' said the Comtesse, as with a slightly trembling hand she conveyed her glass to her lips, "'I scarcely dare to hope.' But already Lord Antony had served out the soup, and for the next few moments all conversation ceased, while Jellyband and Sally handed round the plates, and every one began to eat. "'Faith, madame,' said Lord Antony after a while, "'mine was no idle toast. Seeing yourself, Mademoiselle Suzanne, and my friend the Vicomte safely in England now, surely you must feel reassured as to the fate of Monsieur le Comte.' "'Ah, monsieur,' replied the Comtesse, with a heavy sigh, "'I trust in God.' I can but pray and hope. I, madame, here interposed Sir Andrew Foulkes, trust in God by all means, but believe also a little in your English friends, who have sworn to bring the Count safely across the Channel, even as they have brought you to-day. Indeed, indeed, monsieur, she replied, I have the fullest confidence in you and your friends. Your fame, I assure you, has spread throughout the whole of France. The way some of my own friends have escaped from the clutches of that awful revolutionary tribunal was nothing short of a miracle, and all done by you and your friends. We were but the hands, Madame la Comtesse. But my husband, monsieur, said the Comtesse, whilst unshed tears seemed to veil her voice, he is in such deadly peril. I would never have left him only. There were my children. I was torn between my duty to him and to them. They refused to go without me, and you and your friends assured me so solemnly that my husband would be safe. But, oh, now that I am here amongst you all, in this beautiful free England, I think of him, flying for his life, hunted like a poor beast, in such peril. <laughs> ah, I should not have left him! I should not have left him! The poor woman had completely broken down. Fatigue! sorrow and emotion had overmastered her rigid aristocratic bearing. She was crying gently to herself, whilst Suzanne ran up to her and tried to kiss away her tears. Lord Antony and Sir Andrew had said nothing to interrupt the Comtesse while she was speaking. There was no doubt that they felt deeply for her. Their very silence testified to that. But in every century, and ever since England has been what it is, an Englishman has always felt somewhat ashamed of his own emotion and of his own sympathy, and so the two young men said nothing, and busied themselves in trying to hide their feelings, only succeeding in looking immeasurably sheepish. "'As for me, monsieur,' said Suzanne suddenly, as she looked through a wealth of brown curls across at Sir Andrew, "'I trust you absolutely, and I know that you will bring my dear father safely to England, just as you brought us to-day.' This was said with so much confidence, such unuttered hope and belief, that it seemed as if by magic to dry the mother's eyes, and to bring a smile upon everybody's lips. "'Nay, you shame me, mademoiselle,' replied Sir Andrew. "'Though my life is at your service, I have been but a humble tool in the hands of our great leader, who organised and effected your escape.' He had spoken with so much warmth and vehemence, that Suzanne's eyes fastened upon him in undisguised wonder. "'Your leader, monsieur?' said the Comtesse eagerly. "'Ah, of course! You must have a leader. And I did not think of that before. But tell me, where is he? I must go to him at once, and I and my children must throw ourselves at his feet, and thank him for all that he has done for us.' "'Alas, madame,' said Lord Antony, "'that is impossible.' "'Impossible? Why?' "'Because the Scarlet Pimpernel works in the dark, and his identity is only known under the solemn oath of secrecy to his immediate followers.' "'The Scarlet Pimpernel?' said Suzanne, with a merry laugh. "'Why, what a droll name! What is the Scarlet Pimpernel, monsieur?' She looked at Sir Andrew with eager curiosity. The young man's face had become almost transfigured. His eyes shone with enthusiasm. Hero-worship, love, admiration for his leader seemed literally to glow upon his face. "'The Scarlet Pimpernel, mademoiselle,' he said at last, "'is the name of a humble English wayside flower.' but it is also the name chosen to hide the identity of the best and bravest man in all the world, so that he may better succeed in accomplishing the noble task he has set himself to do. "'Ah, yes,' here interposed the young vicomte, "'I have heard speak of this scarlet pimpernel. A little flower, red, yes? They say in Paris that every time a royalist escapes to England, that devil, Fouquier-Tanville, the public prosecutor, 
received a paper with that little flower designated in red upon it, yes?' "'Yes, that is so,' assented Lord Antony. "'Then you will have received one such paper to-day? "'Undoubtedly.' "'Oh! I wonder what he will say,' said Suzanne merrily. "'I have heard that the picture of that little red flower is the only thing that frightens him.' "'Faith, then,' said Sir Andrew, "'he will have many more opportunities of studying the shape of that small scarlet flower.' "'Ah, monsieur,' sighed the Comtesse, "'it all sounds like a romance, and I cannot understand it all. "'Why should you try, madame? "'But tell me, why should your leader, why should you all, "'spend your money and risk your lives, "'for it is your lives you risk, monsieur, when you set foot in France, "'and all for us French men and women, who are nothing to you? "'Sport, madame la Comtesse, sport,' asserted Lord Antony, "'with his jovial, loud, and pleasant voice.' "'We are a nation of sportsmen, you know, and just now it is the fashion to pull the hair from between the teeth of the hound. "'Ah, no, no, not sport only, monsieur. You have a more noble motive, I am sure, for the good work you do. "'Faith, madame, I would like you to find it, then. "'As for me, I vow I love the game, for this is the finest sport I have yet encountered. "'Hair-breath escapes, the devil's own risks. Tally-ho, and away we go!' But the Comtesse shook her head still incredulously. To her it seemed preposterous that these young men and their great leader, all of them rich, probably well-born and young, should, for no other motive than sport, run the terrible risks which she knew they were constantly doing. Their nationality, once they had set foot in France, would be no safeguard to them. Any one found harbouring or assisting suspected royalists would be ruthlessly condemned and summarily executed, whatever his nationality might be. And this band of young Englishmen had, to her own knowledge, bearded the implacable and bloodthirsty tribunal of the Revolution, within the very walls of Paris itself, and had snatched away condemned victims almost from the very foot of the guillotine. With a shudder she recalled the events of the last few days, her escape from Paris with her two children, all three of them hidden beneath the hood of a rickety cart, lying amidst a heap of turnips and cabbages, not daring to breathe whilst the mob howled, A la lanterne des aristos! at the awful West Barricade. It had all occurred in such a miraculous way. She and her husband had understood that they had been placed on the list of suspected persons, which meant that their trial and death were but a matter of days, of hours, perhaps. Then came the hope of salvation, the mysterious epistle, signed with the enigmatical scarlet device, the clear peremptory directions, the parting from the Comte de Tournay, which had torn the poor wife's heart in two, the hope of reunion, the flight with her two children, the covered cart, that awful hag driving it, who looked like some horrible evil demon, with the ghastly trophy on her whip-handle. The Comtesse looked round at the quaint, old-fashioned English inn, the peace of this land of civil and religious liberty, and she closed her eyes to shut out the haunting vision of that west barricade, and of the mob retreating panic-stricken when the old hag spoke of the plague. Every moment under that cart she expected recognition, arrest, herself and her children tried and condemned, and these young Englishmen, under the guidance of their brave and mysterious leader, had risked their lives to save them all, as they had already saved scores of other innocent people. And all only for sport? Impossible! Suzanne's eyes, as she sought those of Sir Andrew, plainly told him that she thought that he, at any rate, rescued his fellow-men from terrible and unmerited death, through a higher and nobler motive than his friend would have her believe. "'How many are there in your brave league, monsieur?' she asked timidly. Twenty all told, mademoiselle,' he replied. "'One to command, and nineteen to obey. All of us Englishmen, and all pledged to the same cause, to obey our leader, and to rescue the innocent.' "'May God protect you all, monsieur,' said the Comtesse fervently. "'He has done that so far, madame. "'It is wonderful to me, wonderful, that you should all be so brave, so devoted to your fellow-men. "'Yet you are English, and in France treachery is rife, all in the name of liberty and fraternity. "'The women, even in France, have been more bitter against us aristocrats than the men,' said the Vicomte, with a sigh. "'Ah, yes,' added the Comtesse while a look of haughty disdain and intense bitterness shot through her melancholy eyes. There was that woman, Marguerite Saint-Just, for instance. She denounced the Marquis de Saint-Cyr and all his family to the awful tribunal of the terror. "'Marguerite Saint-Just,' said Lord Antony, as he shot a quick and apprehensive glance across at Sir Andrew. "'Marguerite Saint-Just, surely. 
"'Yes,' replied the Comtesse. "'Surely you know her. She was a leading actress of the Comédie Française, and she married an Englishman lately. You must know her.' "'Know her?' said Lord Antony. "'No Lady Blakeney, the most fashionable woman in London, the wife of the richest man in England? Of course we all know Lady Blakeney.' "'She was a schoolfellow of mine at the convent in Paris,' interposed Suzanne, "'and we came over to England together to learn your language. I was very fond of Marguerite, and I cannot believe that she ever did anything so wicked.' "'It certainly seems incredible,' said Sir Andrew. "'You say that she actually denounced the Marquis de Saint-Cyr? Why should she have done such a thing? Surely there must be some mistake.' "'No mistake is possible, monsieur,' rejoined the Comtesse coldly. Marguerite saint Just's brother is a noted Republican. There was some talk of a family feud between him and my cousin, the Marquis de Saint-Cyr. The saint Justs are quite plebeian, and the Republican government employs many spies. I assure you, there is no mistake. You had not heard this story? Faith, madame, I did hear some vague rumours of it, but in England no one would credit it. Sir Percy Blakeney, her husband, is a very wealthy man, of high social position, the intimate friend of the Prince of Wales and Lady Blakeney leads both fashion and society in London. That may be, monsieur, and we shall, of course, lead a very quiet life in England. But I pray God that while I remain in this beautiful country, I may never meet Marguerite Saint-Just. The proverbial wet blanket seemed to have fallen over the merry little company gathered round the table. Suzanne looked sad and silent. Sir Andrew fidgeted uneasily with his fork whilst the Comtesse, encased in the plate armour of her aristocratic prejudices, sat, rigid and unbending, in her straight-backed chair. As for Lord Antony, he looked extremely uncomfortable, and glanced once or twice apprehensively towards Jellyband, who looked just as uncomfortable as himself. "'At what time do you expect Sir Percy and Lady Blakeney?' he contrived to whisper unobserved to mine host. "'Any moment, my lord,' whispered Jellyband in reply. Even as he spoke, a distant clatter was heard of an approaching coach. Louder and louder it grew. One or two shouts became distinguishable, then the rattle of horses' hoofs on the uneven cobblestones, and the next moment a stable-boy had thrown open the coffee-room door, and rushed in excitedly. "'Sir Percy Blakeney and my lady!' he shouted at the top of his voice. "'They're just arriving!' And with more shouting, jingling of harness, and iron hoofs upon the stones, a magnificent coach— drawn by four superb bays, had halted outside the porch of the Fisherman's Rest. End of chapter 4 The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzy Chapter 5 Marguerite In a moment the pleasant, oak-rafted coffee-room of the inn became the scene of hopeless confusion and discomfort. At the first announcement made by the stable-boy, Lord Antony, with a fashionable oath, had jumped up from his seat, and was now giving many and confused directions to poor bewildered Jellyband, who seemed at his wit's end what to do. "'For goodness sake, man,' admonished his lordship, "'try to keep Lady Blakeney talking outside for a moment while the ladies withdraw. Sounds,' he added, with another more emphatic oath, "'this is most unfortunate.' "'Quick, Sally, the candles!' shouted Jellyband, as, hopping about from one leg to another, he ran hither and thither, adding to the general discomfort of everybody. The Comtesse, too, had risen to her feet, rigid and erect, trying to hide her excitement beneath more becoming sang froid She repeated mechanically, "'I will not see her! I will not see her!' Outside, the excitement attendant upon the arrival of very important guests grew apace. "'Good day, Sir Percy. Good day to your ladyship. Your servant, Sir Percy,' was heard in one long, continued chorus, with alternate, more feeble tones of, "'Remember the poor blind men of your charity, lady and gentleman.' Then, suddenly, a singularly sweet voice was heard through all the din. "'Let the poor man be, and give him some supper at my expense.' The voice was low and musical, with a slight sing-song in it, and a faint sous-son of foreign intonation in the pronunciation of the consonants. Every one in the coffee-room heard it, and paused instinctively, listening to it for a moment. Sally was holding the candles by the opposite door, which led to the bedrooms upstairs, and the Comtesse was in the act of beating a hasty retreat before that enemy who owned such a sweet, musical voice. Suzanne reluctantly was preparing to follow her mother, while casting regretful glances towards the door, where she hoped still to see her dearly beloved, erstwhile schoolfellow. Then Jellyband threw open the door, still stupidly and blindly hoping to avert the catastrophe which he felt was in the air, and the same low musical voice said, with a merry laugh and mock consternation, 
Oh, I am as wet as a herring. Dear, has any one ever seen such a contemptible climate? Suzanne, come with me at once. I wish it, said the Comtesse peremptorily. Oh, mamma, pleaded Suzanne. My lady, uh, <clears throat> my lady, came in feeble accents from Jellyband, who stood clumsily trying to bar the way. Pardieu, my good man, said Lady Blakeney with some impatience. What are you standing in my way for, dancing about like a turkey with a sore foot? Let me get to the fire. I am perished with the cold. And the next moment, Lady Blakeney, gently pushing mine host on one side, had swept into the coffee room. There are many portraits and miniatures extant of Marguerite St. Just, Lady Blakeney as she was then, but it is doubtful if any of these really do her singular beauty justice. Tall, above the average, with magnificent presence and regal figure, it is small wonder that even the Comtesse paused for a moment in involuntary admiration before turning her back on so fascinating an apparition. Marguerite Blakeney was then scarcely five and twenty, and her beauty was at its most dazzling stage. The large hat, with its undulating and waving plumes, threw a soft shadow across the classic brow, with the aureole of auburn hair, free at the moment from any powder. The sweet, almost childlike mouth, the straight, chiselled nose, round chin, and delicate throat, all seemed set off by the picturesque costume of the period. The rich blue velvet robe moulded in its every line the graceful contour of the figure, whilst one tiny hand held, with a dignity all its own, the tall stick adorned with a large bunch of ribbons which fashionable ladies of the period had taken to carrying recently. With a quick glance all around the room, Marguerite Blakeney had taken stock of every one there. She nodded pleasantly to Sir Andrew Foulkes, whilst extending a hand to Lord Antony. "'Hello, my Lord Tony! Why, what are you doing here in Dover?' she said merrily. Then, without waiting for a reply, she turned and faced the Comtesse and Suzanne. Her whole face lighted up with additional brightness as she stretched out both arms toward the young girl. "'Why, if it isn't my little Suzanne over there! Bah, dear little citizeness! How came you to be in England? And Madame, too!' She went up effusive to them both, with not a single touch of embarrassment in her manner or in her smile. Lord Tony and Sir Andrew watched the little scene with eager apprehension. English though they were, they had often been in France, and had mixed sufficiently with the French to realise the unbending hauteur, the bitter hatred with which the old noblesse of France viewed all those who had helped to contribute to their downfall. Armand Saint-Just, the brother of beautiful Lady Blakeney, though known to hold moderate and conciliatory views, was an ardent republican. His feud with the ancient family of Saint-Cyr, the rights and wrongs of which no outsider ever knew, had culminated in the downfall, the almost total extinction of the latter. In France, Saint-Just and his party had triumphed, and here in England, face to face with these three refugees driven from their country, flying for their lives, bereft of all which centuries of luxury had given them, there stood a fair scion of those same republican families which had hurled down a throne, and uprooted an aristocracy whose origin was lost in the dim and distant vista of bygone centuries. She stood there before them, in all the unconscious insolence of beauty, and stretched out her dainty hand to them, as if she would, by that one act, bridge over the conflict and bloodshed of the past decade. Suzanne, I forbid you to speak to that woman— said the Comtesse sternly, as she placed a restraining hand upon her daughter's arm. She had spoken in English, so that all might hear and understand. The two young English gentlemen, as well as the common innkeeper and his daughter. The latter literally gasped with horror at this foreign insolence, this impudence before her ladyship, who was English, now that she was Sir Percy's wife, and a friend of the Princess of Wales, to boot. As for Lord Antony and Sir Andrew Foulkes, their very hearts seemed to stand still with horror at this gratuitous insult. One of them uttered an exclamation of appeal, the other one of warning, and instinctively both glanced hurriedly towards the door, whence a slow, drawly, not unpleasant voice had already been heard. Alone among those present, Marguerite Blakeney and the Comtesse de Tournay had remained seemingly unmoved. The latter, rigid, erect, and defiant, with one hand still upon her daughter's arm, seemed the very personification of unbending pride. For the moment Marguerite's sweet face had become as white as the soft fichu which swathed her throat, and a very keen observer might have noted that the hand which held the tall, beribboned stick was clenched, and trembled somewhat. But this was only momentary. 
The next instant the delicate eyebrows were raised slightly, the lips curved sarcastically upwards, the clear blue eyes looked straight at the rigid comtesse, and with a slight shrug of the shoulders, hoity toity, citizeness, she said gaily, what fly stings you, pray? We are in England now, madame, rejoined the comtesse coldly, and I am at liberty to forbid my daughter to touch your hand in friendship. Come, Suzanne. She beckoned to her daughter, and without another look at Marguerite Blakeney, but with a deep, old fashioned curtsy to the two young men, she sailed majestically out of the room. There was silence in the old inn parlour for a moment, as the rustle of the comtesse's skirts died away down the passage. Marguerite, rigid as a statue, followed with hard set eyes the upright figure as it disappeared through the doorway. But as little Suzanne, humble and obedient, was about to follow her mother, the hard set expression suddenly vanished, and a wistful, almost pathetic and childlike look stole into Lady Blakeney's eyes. Little Suzanne caught that look. The child's sweet nature went out to the beautiful woman, scarcely older than herself. Filial obedience vanished before girlish sympathy. At the door she turned, ran back to Marguerite, and putting her arms round her, kissed her effusively. Then only did she follow her mother, Sally bringing up the rear, with a final curtsy to my lady. Suzanne's sweet and dainty impulse had relieved the unpleasant tension. Sir Andrew's eyes followed the pretty little figure until it had quite disappeared. Then they met Lady Blakeney's with unassumed merriment. Marguerite, with dainty affection, had kissed her hand to the ladies as they disappeared through the door. Then a humorous smile began hovering around the corners of her mouth. "'So that's it, is it?' she said gaily. "'La, Sir Andrew, did you ever see such an unpleasant person? I hope when I grow old I shan't look like that.' She gathered up her skirts, and, assuming a majestic gait, stalked towards the fireplace. "'Suzanne!' she said, mimicking the comtesse's voice, "'I forbid you to speak to that woman.' The laugh which accompanied this sally sounded, perhaps, a trifle forced and hard, but neither Sir Andrew nor Lord Tony were very keen observers. The mimicry was so perfect, the tone of voice so accurately reproduced, that both the young men joined in a hearty, cheerful bravo. "'Ah, Lady Blakeney,' added Lord Tony, "'how they must miss you at the Comédie Française, and how the Parisians must hate Sir Percy for having taken you away. Lud, man!' rejoined Marguerite, with a shrug of her graceful shoulders. "'Tis impossible to hate Sir Percy for anything. His witty sallies would disarm even Madame la Comtesse herself." The young vicomte, who had not elected to follow his mother in her dignified exit, now made a step forward, ready to champion the Comtesse, should Lady Blakeney aim any further shafts at her. But before he could utter a preliminary word of protest, a pleasant though distinctly inane laugh was heard from outside and the next moment an unusually tall and very richly dressed figure appeared in the doorway. End of chapter 5《The Scarlet Pimpernel》by Baroness Orzy Chapter 6 — An Exquisite of Ninety-Two Sir Percy Blakeney, as the chronicles of the time inform us, was in this year of grace 1792 still a year or two on the right side of thirty. Tall, above the average even for an Englishman, broad-shouldered and massively built, he would have been called unusually good-looking, but for a certain lazy expression in his deep-set blue eyes, and that perpetual inane laugh which seemed to disfigure his strong, clearly-cut mouth. It was nearly a year ago now that Sir Percy Blakeney Baronet, one of the richest men in England, leader of all the fashions, and intimate friend of the Prince of Wales, had astonished fashionable society in London and Bath by bringing home from one of his journeys abroad a beautiful, fascinating, clever French wife. He, the sleepiest, dullest, most British Britisher that had ever set a pretty woman yawning, had secured a brilliant matrimonial prize, for which, as all chroniclers aver, there had been many competitors. Marguerite St. Just had first made her debut in artistic Parisian circles, at the very moment when the greatest social upheaval the world has ever known was taking place within its very walls. Scarcely eighteen, lavishly gifted with beauty and talent, chaperoned only by a young and devoted brother, she had soon gathered round her, in her charming apartment in the Rue Richelieu, a coterie which was as brilliant as it was exclusive. Exclusive, that is to say, only from one point of view. Marguerite St. Just was from principle and by conviction a republican. Equality of birth was her motto, inequality of fortune was in her eyes a mere untoward accident, but the only inequality she admitted was that of talent. 
"'Money and titles may be hereditary,' she would say, "'but brains are not.' And thus her charming salon was reserved for originality and intellect, for brilliance and wit, for clever men and talented women, and the entrance into it was soon looked upon in the world of intellect, which even in those days and in those troublous times found its pivot in Paris, as the seal to an artistic career. Clever men, distinguished men, and even men of exalted station, formed a perpetual and brilliant court round the fascinating young actress of the Comédie Française and she glided through republican, revolutionary, bloodthirsty Paris, like a shining comet with a trail behind her of all that was most distinguished, most interesting, in intellectual Europe. Then the climax came. Some smiled indulgently, and called it an artistic eccentricity. Others looked upon it as a wise provision, in view of the many events which were crowding thick and fast in Paris just then. But to all, the real motive of that climax remained a puzzle and a mystery. Anyway, Marguerite St. Just married Sir Percy Blakeney one fine day, just like that, without any warning to her friends, without a soirée de contrat or or dîner de fiancé, or other appurtenances of a fashionable French wedding. How that stupid, dull Englishman ever came to be admitted within the intellectual circle which revolved round the cleverest woman in Europe, as her friends unanimously called her, no one ventured to guess. Golden key is said to open every door, asserted the more malignantly inclined. Enough. She married him, and the cleverest woman in Europe had linked her fate to that demmed idiot Blakeney, and not even her most intimate friends could assign to this strange step any other motive than that of supreme eccentricity. Those friends who knew laughed to scorn the idea that Marguerite St. Just had married a fool for the sake of the worldly advantages with which he might endow her. They knew, as a matter of fact, that Marguerite St. Just cared nothing about money, and still less about a title. Moreover, there were at least half a dozen other men in the cosmopolitan world, equally well-born, if not so wealthy as Blakeney, who would have been only too happy to give Marguerite St. Just any position she might choose to covet. As for Sir Percy himself, he was universally voted to be totally unqualified for the onerous post he had taken upon himself. His chief qualifications for it seemed to consist in his blind adoration for her, his great wealth, and the high favour in which he stood at the English court. But London society thought that, taking into consideration his own intellectual limitations, it would have been wiser on his part had he bestowed those worldly advantages upon a less brilliant and witty wife. Although lately he had been so prominent a figure in fashionable English society, he had spent most of his early life abroad. His father, the late Sir Algernon Blakeney, had had the terrible misfortune of seeing an idolised young wife become hopelessly insane after two years of happy married life. Percy had just been born when the late Lady Blakeney fell prey to the terrible malady which in those days was looked upon as hopelessly incurable, and nothing short of a curse of God upon the entire family. Sir Algernon took his afflicted young wife abroad, and there, presumably, Percy was educated, and grew up between an imbecile mother and a distracted father, until he attained his majority. The death of his parents, following close one upon another, left him a free man and as Sir Algernon had led a forcibly simple and retired life, the large Blakeney fortune had increased tenfold. Sir Percy Blakeney had travelled a great deal abroad, before he brought home his beautiful young French wife. The fashionable circles of the time were ready to receive them both with open arms. Sir Percy was rich, his wife was accomplished, the Prince of Wales took a very great liking to them both. Within six months they were the acknowledged leaders of fashion and of style. Sir Percy's coats were the talk of the town, his inanities were quoted, his foolish laugh copied by the gilded youth at Ormax or the Mall. Every one knew that he was hopelessly stupid, but then that was scarcely to be wondered at, seeing that all the Blakeneys for generations had been notoriously dull, and that his mother died an imbecile. Thus society accepted him, petted him, made much of him, since his horses were the finest in the country, his fates and wines the most sought after. As for his marriage with the cleverest woman in Europe, well, the inevitable came with sure and rapid footsteps. No one pitied him, since his fate was of his own making. There were plenty of young ladies in England, of high birth and good looks, who would have been quite willing to help him spend the Blakeney fortune, whilst smiling indulgently at his inanities and his good-humoured foolishness. Moreover, Sir Percy got no pity, because he seemed to require none. He seemed very proud of his clever wife, and to care little that she took no pains to disguise that good-natured contempt which she evidently felt for him and that she even amused herself by sharpening her ready wits at his expense. 
But then Blakeney was really too stupid to notice the ridicule with which his wife covered him, and if his matrimonial relations with the fascinating Parisienne had not turned out all that his hopes and his dog-like devotion for her had pictured, society could never do more than vaguely guess at it. In his beautiful house at Richmond he played second fiddle to his clever wife with imperturbable bonhomie. He lavished jewels and luxuries of all kinds upon her, which she took with inimitable grace, dispensing the hospitality of his superb mansion with the same graciousness with which she had welcomed the intellectual coterie of Paris. Physically, Sir Percy Blakeney was undeniably handsome, always accepting the lazy, bored look which was habitual to him. He was always irreproachably dressed, and wore the exaggerated incroyable fashions which had just crept across from Paris to England, with the perfect good taste innate in an English gentleman. On this special afternoon in September, in spite of the long journey by coach, in spite of rain and mud, his coat set irreproachably across his fine shoulders, his hands looked almost femininely white, as they emerged through billowy frills of the finest mechlin lace. The extravagantly short-waisted satin coat, wide-lapelled waistcoat, and tight-fitting striped breeches set off his massive figure to perfection and in repose one might have admired so fine a specimen of English manhood, until the foppish ways, the affected movements, the perpetual inane laugh, brought one's admiration of Sir Percy Blakeney to an abrupt close. He had lolled into the old-fashioned inn parlour, shaking the wet off his fine overcoat. Then, putting up a gold-rimmed eyeglass to his lazy blue eye, he surveyed the company upon whom an embarrassed silence had suddenly fallen. "'How do, Tony? How do, folks?' he said, recognising the two young men and shaking them by the hands. "'Zounds, my dear fellow,' he added, smothering a slight yawn. "'Did you ever see such a beastly day? Damned climate, this!' With a quaint little laugh, half of embarrassment and half of sarcasm, Marguerite had turned towards her husband, and was surveying him from head to foot, with an amused little twinkle in her merry blue eyes. "'Ah!' said Sir Percy, after a moment or two's silence, as no one offered any comment. "'How sheepish you all look! What's up?' "'Oh, nothing, Sir Percy,' replied Marguerite, with a certain amount of gaiety, which, however, sounded somewhat forced. "'Nothing to disturb your equanimity. Only an insult to your wife.' The laugh which accompanied this remark was evidently intended to reassure Sir Percy as to the gravity of the incident. It apparently succeeded in that, for, echoing the laugh, he rejoined placidly, "'La, my dear, you don't say so. Begad! Who was the bold man who dared to tackle you, eh?' Lord Tony tried to interpose, but had no time to do so, for the young vicomte had already quickly stepped forward. "'Monsieur,' he said, prefixing his little speech with an elaborate bow, and speaking in broken English, "'my mother, the Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive, has offenced Madame, who I see is your wife. I cannot ask your pardon for my mother. What she does is right in my eyes. But I am ready to offer you the usual reparation between men of honour. The young man drew up his slim stature to its full height, and looked very enthusiastic, very proud, and very hot, as he gazed at six foot odd of gorgeousness as represented by Sir Percy Blakeney, baronet. "'Lud, Sir Andrew,' said Marguerite, with one of her merry, infectious laughs, "'look on that pretty picture—the English turkey and the French bantam.' The simile was quite perfect, and the English turkey looked down with complete bewilderment upon the dainty little French bantam, which hovered quite threateningly around him. "'La, sir,' said Sir Percy at last, putting up his eyeglass, and surveying the young Frenchman with undisguised wonderment, "'where in the cuckoo's name did you learn to speak English?' "'Monsieur,' protested the vicomte, somewhat abashed at the way his warlike attitude had been taken by the ponderous-looking Englishman. "'I protest is marvellous," continued Sir Percy imperturbably. "'Demmed marvellous! Didn't you think so, Tony, eh? I vow I can't speak French lingo like that. What?' "'Nay, I'll vouch for that,' rejoined Marguerite. "'Sir Percy has a British accent you could cut with a knife.' "'Monsieur,' interposed the vicomte earnestly, and in still more broken English, "'I fear you have not understand. I offer you the only possible reparation among gentlemen.' "'What the devil is that?' asked Sir Percy blandly. "'My sword, monsieur,' replied the vicomte, who, though still bewildered, was beginning to lose his temper. "'You are a sportsman, Lord Tony,' said Marguerite merrily, ten to one on the little bantam. But Sir Percy was staring sleepily at the vicomte for a moment or two through his partly closed, heavy lids. Then he smothered another yawn, stretched his long limbs, and turned leisurely away. "'Lord love you, sir,' he muttered good-humouredly. "'Demn it, young man, what's the good of your sword to me?' 
what the Vicomte thought and felt at that moment, when that long-limbed Englishman treated him with such marked insolence, might fill volumes of sound reflections. What he said resolved itself into a single articulate word, for all the others were choked in his throat by his surging wrath. "'A duel, monsieur!' he stammered. Once more Blakeney turned, and from his high altitude looked down on the choleric little man before him. But not even for a second did he seem to lose his own imperturbable good humour. He laughed his own pleasant and inane laugh, and, burying his slender long hands into the capacious pockets of his overcoat, he said leisurely, "'A bloodthirsty young ruffian! Do you want to make a hold in a law-abiding man? As for me, sir, I never fight duels,' he added, as he placidly sat down and stretched his long, lazy legs out before him. "'Demmed uncomfortable things, duels, ain't they, Tony?' Now the Vicomte had no doubt vaguely heard that in England the fashion of duelling amongst gentlemen had been suppressed by the law with a very stern hand. Still to him, a Frenchman whose notions of bravery and honour were based upon a code that had centuries of tradition to back it, the spectacle of a gentleman actually refusing to fight a duel was little short of an enormity. In his mind he vaguely pondered whether he should strike that long-legged Englishman in the face and call him a coward or whether such conduct in a lady's presence might be deemed ungentlemanly, when Marguerite happily interposed. "'I pray you, Lord Tony,' she said in that gentle, sweet, musical voice of hers, "'I pray you play the peacemaker. The child is bursting with rage, and,' she added with a sous-song of dry sarcasm, "'might do Sir Percy an injury.' She added a mocking little laugh, which, however, did not in the least disturb her husband's placid equanimity. "'The British turkey has had the day,' she said. "'Sir Percy would provoke all the saints in the calendar, and keep his temper the while.' But already Blakeney, good-humoured as ever, had joined in the laugh against himself. "'Damned smart that now, wasn't it?' he said, turning pleasantly to the Vicomte. "'Clever woman, my wife, sir. You will find that out if you live long enough in England.' "'Sir Percy is right, Vicomte,' here interposed Lord Antony, laying a friendly hand on the young Frenchman's shoulder. It would hardly be fitting that you should commence your career in England by provoking him to a duel. For a moment longer the Vicomte hesitated, then with a slight shrug of the shoulders directed against the extraordinary code of honour prevailing in this fog-ridden island, he said with becoming dignity, "'Ah, well, if monsieur is satisfied, I have no griefs. You, milor, are our protector. If I have done wrong, I withdraw myself.' "'I do,' rejoined Blakeney, with a long sigh of satisfaction. "'Withdraw yourself over there. Damned excitable little puppy,' he added under his breath. "'Faith, folks, if that's a specimen of the goods you and your friends bring over from France, my advice to you is, drop a mid-channel, my friend, or I shall have to see old Pitt about it, get him to clap on a prohibitive tariff, and put you in the stocks and you smuggle.' "'Last, Sir Percy, your chivalry misguides you,' said Marguerite coquettishly. "'You forget that you yourself have imported one bundle of goods from France.' Blakeney slowly rose to his feet, and, making a deep and elaborate bow before his wife, he said with consummate gallantry, "'I had the pick of the market, madame, and my taste is unerring.' "'More so than your chivalry, I fear,' she retorted sarcastically. "'Odds life, my dear, be reasonable. Do you think I am going to allow my body to be made a pincushion of by every little frog-eater who don't like the shape of your nose?' "'Lots, Sir Percy,' laughed Lady Blakeney, as she bobbed him a quaint and pretty curtsy. "'You need not be afraid. "'Tis not the men who dislike the shape of my nose.' "'Afraid be demmed. "'Do you impugn my bravery, madame? "'I don't patronise the ring for nothing, do I, Tony? "'I've put up the fists with Red Sam before now, "'and, and he didn't get it all his own way, either.' "'Faith, Sir Percy,' said Marguerite, with a long and merry laugh, "'that went echoing along the old oak rafters of the parlour. "'I would I had seen you then. <laughs> "'You must have looked a pretty picture, and, <laughs> and to be afraid of a little French boy. "'Ha, <laughs> echoed Sir Percy good-humouredly. "'La, madame, you honour me. Zooks, folks, mark ye that. "'I have made my wife laugh, the cleverest woman in Europe. "'Odds fish, we must have a bowl on that.' "'And he tapped vigorously on the table near him. "'Hey, Jelly, quick, man!' "'Here, Jelly!' Harmony was once more restored. Mr. Jellyband, with a mighty effort, recovered himself from the many emotions he had experienced within the last half-hour. "'A bowl of punch, Jelly, hot and strong, eh?' said Sir Percy. "'The wits that have just made a clever woman laugh must be wetted. Ha! <laughs> Hasten, my good Jelly!' 
"'Nay, there is no time, Sir Percy,' interposed Marguerite. "'The skipper will be here directly, and my brother must get on board, or the daydream will miss the tide. Time, my dear. There is plenty of time for any gentleman to get drunk and get on board before the turn of the tide.' "'I think, your ladyship,' said Jellyband respectfully, "'that the young gentleman is coming along now with Sir Percy's skipper.' "'That's right,' said Blakeney. "'Then Armand can join us in the merry bowl. "'Think you, Tony,' he added, turning towards the vicomte, "'that the jackanapes of yours will join us in a glass. "'Tell him that we drink in token of reconciliation.' "'In fact, you are all such merry company,' said Marguerite, "'that I trust you will forgive me if I bid my brother good-bye in another room.' It would have been bad form to protest. Both Lord Antony and Sir Andrew felt that Lady Blakeney could not altogether be in tune with them at the moment. Her love for her brother, Armand St. Just, was deep and touching in the extreme. He had just spent a few weeks with her in her English home, and was going back to serve his country, at the moment when death was the usual reward for the most enduring devotion. Sir Percy also made no attempt to detain his wife. With that perfect, somewhat affected gallantry which characterised his every movement, he opened the coffee-room door for her, and made her the most approved and elaborate bow, which the fashion of the time dictated, as she sailed out of the room, without bestowing on him more than a passing, slightly contemptuous glance. Only Sir Andrew Foulkes, whose every thought since he had met Suzanne de Dournay seemed keener, more gentle, more innately sympathetic, noted the curious look of intense longing, of deep and hopeless passion, with which the inane and flippant Sir Percy followed the retreating figure of his brilliant wife. End of chapter 6《The Scarlet Pimpernel》by Baroness Orzy Chapter 7 — The Secret Orchard Once outside the noisy coffee-room, along in the dimly lighted passage, Marguerite Blakeney seemed to breathe more freely. She heaved a deep sigh, like one who had long been oppressed with the heavy weight of constant self-control, and she allowed a few tears to fall unheeded down her cheeks. Outside the rain had ceased, and through the swiftly passing clouds the pale rays of an after-storm sun shone upon the beautiful white coast of Kent and the quaint irregular houses that clustered round the Admiralty Pier. Marguerite Blakeney stepped onto the porch and looked out to sea. Silhouetted against the ever-changing sky, a graceful schooner, with white sails set, was gently dancing in the breeze. The daydream it was, Sir Percy Blakeney's yacht, which was ready to take Armand St. Just back to France, into the very midst of that seething, bloody revolution which was overthrowing a monarchy, attacking a religion, destroying a society, in order to try and rebuild upon the ashes of tradition a new utopia, of which a few men dreamed but which none had the power to establish. In the distance two figures were approaching the fisherman's rest. One, an oldish man, with a curious fringe of grey hairs round a rotund and massive chin, and who walked with that peculiar rolling gait which invariably betrays the seafaring man. The other, a young, slight figure, neatly and becomingly dressed in a dark, many-caped overcoat. He was cleanly shaved, and his dark hair was taken well back over a clear and noble forehead. "'Armand!' said Marguerite Blakeney, as soon as she saw him approaching from the distance, and a happy smile shone on her sweet face, even through the tears. A moment or two later, brother and sister were locked in each other's arms, while the old skipper stood respectfully on one side. "'How much time have we got, Briggs?' asked Lady Blakeney, before Monsieur St. Just need go on board." "'We ought to weigh anchor before half an hour, your ladyship,' replied the old man, pulling at his grey forelock. Linking her arm in his, Marguerite led her brother towards the cliffs. "'Half an hour,' she said, looking wistfully out to sea. "'Half an hour more, and you'll be far from me, Armand. Oh, I can't believe that you are going, dear. These last few days, whilst Percy has been away, and I've had you all to myself, have slipped by like a dream. I'm not going far, sweet one.' said the young man gently. A narrow channel to cross, a few miles of road. I can soon come back. Nay, it is not the distance, Armand, but that awful Paris, just now. They had reached the edge of the cliff. The gentle sea-breeze blew Marguerite's hair about her face, and sent the ends of her soft lace fichu waving around her, like a white and supple snake. She tried to pierce the distance far away, 
beyond which lay the shores of France, that relentless and stern France, which was exacting her pound of flesh, the blood tax, from the noblest of her sons. Our own beautiful country, Marguerite, said Armand, who seemed to have divined her thoughts. They are going too far, Armand, she said vehemently. You are a Republican, so am I. We have the same thoughts, the same enthusiasm for liberty and equality. But even you must think that they are going too far. Hush! said Armand, instinctively, as he threw a quick, apprehensive glance around him. Ah, you see, you don't think yourself that it is safe even to speak of these things here in England. She clung to him suddenly with strong, almost motherly passion. Don't go, Armand, she begged. Don't go back. What should I do if. 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 Her voice was choked in sobs. Her eyes, tender, blue, and loving, gazed appealingly at the young man, who in his turn looked steadfastly into hers. You would in any case be my own brave sister, he said gently, who would remember that, when France is in peril, it is not for her sons to turn their backs on her. Even as he spoke, that sweet childlike smile crept back into her face, pathetic in the extreme, for it seemed drowned in tears. Oh, Armand, she said quaintly, I sometimes wish you had not so many lofty virtues. I assure you, little sins are far less dangerous and uncomfortable. But you will be prudent, she added earnestly, as far as possible, I promise you. Remember, dear, I have only you to—to to care for me. Nay, sweet one, you have other interests now. Percy cares for you. A look of strange wistfulness crept into her eyes as she murmured, He did. Once. But surely— "'There, there, dear, don't distress yourself on my account. Percy is very good.' "'Nay,' he interrupted energetically, "'I will distress myself on your account, my Margot. "'Listen, dear, I have not spoken of these things to you before. "'Something always seemed to stop me when I wished to question you. "'But somehow I feel as if I could not go away and leave you now "'without asking you one question. "'You need not answer it if you do not wish,' he added, "'as he noted a sudden hard look, almost of apprehension, darting through her eyes. "'What is it?' she asked simply. "'Does Percy Blakeney know that—I mean, does he know the part you played in the arrest of the Marquis de Saint-Cyr?' She laughed, a mirthless, bitter, contemptuous laugh, which was like a jarring chord in the music of her voice. "'That I denounced the Marquis de Saint-Cyr, you mean, to the tribunal that ultimately sent him and all his family to the guillotine?' "'Yes, he does know. I told him after I married him.' You told him all the circumstances, which so completely exonerated you from any blame? It was too late to talk of circumstances. He heard the story from other sources. My confession came too tardily, it seems. I could no longer plead extenuating circumstances. I could not demean myself by trying to explain. And? And now I have the satisfaction, Armand, of knowing that the biggest fool in England has the most complete contempt for his wife. She spoke with vehement bitterness this time, and Armand St. Just, who loved her so dearly, felt that he had placed a somewhat clumsy finger upon an aching wound. "'But Sir Percy loved you, Margot,' he repeated gently. "'Loved me?' "'Well, Armand, I thought at one time that he did, or I should not have married him.' "'I dare say,' she added, speaking very rapidly, as if she were about to lay down a heavy burden which had oppressed her for months— I dare say that even you thought, as everybody else did, that I married Sir Percy because of his wealth. But I assure you, dear, that it was not so. He seemed to worship me with a curious intensity of concentrated passion, which went straight to my heart. I had never loved any one before, as you know, and I was four-and-twenty then, so I naturally thought that it must not be in my nature to love. But it has always seemed to me that it must be heavenly to be loved blindly, passionately, wholly worshipped, in fact, and the very fact that Percy was slow and stupid was an attraction for me, as I thought he would love me all the more. A clever man would naturally have other interests, an ambitious man other hopes. I thought that a fool would worship and think of nothing else, and I was ready to respond, Armand. I would have allowed myself to be worshipped, and given infinite tenderness in return. She sighed, and there was a world of disillusionment in that sigh. Armand Saint-Just had allowed her to speak on without interruption. He listened to her, whilst allowing his own thoughts to run riot. It was terrible to see a young and beautiful woman, a girl in all but name, still standing almost at the threshold of her life, 
yet bereft of hope, bereft of illusions, bereft of all those golden and fantastic dreams which should have made her youth one long perpetual holiday. Yet perhaps, though he loved his sister dearly, perhaps he understood. He had studied men in many countries, men of all ages, men of every grade of social and intellectual status, and inwardly he understood what Marguerite had left unsaid. Granted that Percy Blakeney was dull-witted, but in his slow-going mind there would still be room for that ineradicable pride of a descendant of a long line of English gentlemen. A Blakeney had died on Bosworth Field, another had sacrificed life and fortune for the sake of a treacherous steward, and that same pride, foolish and prejudiced as the Republican Armand would call it, must have been stung to the quick on hearing of the sin which lay at Lady Blakeney's door. She had been young, misguided, ill-advised, perhaps. Armand knew that. Her impulses and imprudence knew it still better. But Blakeney was slow-witted. He would not listen to circumstances. He only clung to facts, and these had shown him Lady Blakeney denouncing a fellow-man to a tribunal that knew no pardon, and the contempt he would feel for the deed she had done, however unwittingly, would kill that same love in him, in which sympathy and intellectuality could never have had a part. Yet even now, his own sister puzzled him. Life and love have such strange vagaries. Could it be that with the waning of her husband's love, Marguerite's heart had awakened with love for him? Strange extremes meet in love's pathway. This woman, who had had half intellectual Europe at her feet, might perhaps have set her affections on a fool. Marguerite was gazing out towards the sunset. Armand could not see her face, but presently it seemed to him that something which glittered for a moment in the golden evening light fell from her eyes on to her dainty fichu of lace. But he could not broach that subject with her. He knew her strange, passionate nature so well, and knew that reserve which lurked behind her frank, open ways. They had always been together, these two, for their parents had died when Armand was still a youth and Marguerite but a child. He, some eight years her senior, had watched over her until her marriage had chaperoned her during those brilliant years spent in the flat on the Rue de Richelieu, and had seen her enter upon this new life of hers here in England, with much sorrow and some foreboding. This was his first visit to England since her marriage, and the few months of separation had already seemed to have built up a slight, thin partition between brother and sister. The same deep, intense love was still there on both sides, but each now seemed to have a secret orchard into which the other dared not penetrate. There was much Armand St. Just could not tell his sister. The political aspect of the revolution in France was changing almost every day. She might not understand how his own views and sympathies might become modified, even as the excesses committed by those who had been his friends grew in horror and in intensity. And Marguerite could not speak to her brother about the secrets of her heart. She hardly understood them herself. She only knew that, in the midst of luxury, she felt lonely and unhappy. And now Armand was going away. She feared for his safety. She longed for his presence. She would not spoil these last few sadly sweet moments by speaking about herself. She led him gently along the cliffs, then down to the beach. Their arms linked in one another's. They still had so much to say that lay just outside that secret orchard of theirs. End of chapter 7《The Scarlet Pimpernel》by Baroness Orzy Chapter Eight: The Accredited Agent The afternoon was rapidly drawing to a close, and a long, chilly English summer's evening was throwing a misty pall over the green Kentish landscape. The daydream had set sail, and Marguerite Blakeney stood alone on the edge of the cliff over an hour, watching those white sails which bore so swiftly away from her the only being who really cared for her, whom she dared to love, whom she knew she could trust. Some little distance away to her left, the lights from the coffee room of the fisherman's rest glittered yellow in the gathering mist. From time to time it seemed to her aching nerves as if she could catch from thence the sound of merry-making and of jovial talk or even that perpetual, senseless laugh of her husband's, which grated continually upon her sensitive ears. Sir Percy had had the delicacy to leave her severely alone. She supposed that, in his own stupid, good-natured way, he may have understood that she would wish to remain alone, while those white sails disappeared into the vague horizon so many miles away. 
he whose notions of propriety and decorum were supersensitive, had not suggested even that an attendant should remain within call. Marguerite was grateful to her husband for all this. She always tried to be grateful to him for his thoughtfulness, which was constant, and for his generosity, which really was boundless. She tried even at times to curb the sarcastic, bitter thoughts of him, which made her, in spite of herself, say cruel, insulting things, which she vaguely hoped would wound him. Yes, she often wished to wound him, to make him feel that she too held him in contempt, that she too had forgotten that she had almost loved him, loved that inane fop, whose thoughts seemed unable to soar beyond the tying of a cravat, or the new cut of a coat. Bah! And yet, vague memories that were sweet and ardent and attuned to this calm summer's evening, came wafted back to her memory on the invisible wings of the light sea-breeze. The time when first he worshipped her. He seemed so devoted, a very slave, and there was a certain latent intensity in that love which had fascinated her. Then suddenly that love, that devotion, which throughout his courtship she had looked upon as the slavish fidelity of a dog, seemed to vanish completely. Twenty-four hours after the simple little ceremony at old St. Roche, she had told him the story of how, inadvertently, she had spoken of certain matters connected with the Marquis de Saint-Cyr before some men, her friends, who had used this information against the unfortunate Marquis, and sent him and his family to the guillotine. She hated the Marquis. Years ago, Armand, her dear brother, loved Angèle de Saint-Cyr. But Saint-Just was a plebeian, and the Marquis, full of the pride and arrogant prejudices of his caste, one day Armand, the respectful, timid lover, ventured on sending a small poem, enthusiastic, ardent, passionate, to the idol of his dreams. The next night he was waylaid, just outside Paris, by the valets of Marquis de Saint-Cyr, and ignominiously thrashed, thrashed like a dog within an inch of his life, because he had dared to raise his eyes to the daughter of the aristocrat. The incident was one which, in those days, some two years before the Great Revolution, was of almost daily occurrence in France. Incidents of that type, in fact, led to bloody reprisals, which a few years later sent most of those haughty heads to the guillotine. Marguerite remembered it all. What her brother must have suffered in his manhood and his pride must have been appalling. What she suffered through him, and with him, she never attempted even to analyse. Then the day of retribution came. Saint-Cyr and his kin had found their masters, in those same plebeians whom they had despised. Armand and Marguerite, both intellectual thinking beings, adopted with the enthusiasm of their years the utopian doctrines of the Revolution, while the Marquis de Saint-Cyr and his family fought inch by inch for the retention of those privileges which had placed them socially above their fellow-men. Marguerite, impulsive, thoughtless, not calculating the purport of her words, still smarting under the terrible insult her brother had suffered at the Marquis's hands, happened to hear, amongst her own coterie, that the Saint-Cyrs were in treasonable correspondence with Austria, hoping to obtain the Emperor's support to quell the growing revolution in their own country. In those days one denunciation was sufficient. Marguerite's few thoughtless words anent the Marquis de Saint-Cyr bore fruit within twenty-four hours. He was arrested. His papers were searched. Letters from the Austrian Emperor, promising to send troops against the Paris populace, were found in his desk. He was arraigned for treason against the nation, and sent to the guillotine, whilst his family, his wife and his sons, shared in this awful fate. Marguerite, horrified at the terrible consequences of her own thoughtlessness, was powerless to save the Marquis. His own coterie, her own coterie, the leaders of the revolutionary movement, all proclaimed her as a heroine. And when she married Sir Percy Blakeney, she did not, perhaps, altogether realise how severely he would look upon the sin which she had so inadvertently committed, and which still lay heavily upon her soul. She made full confession of it to her husband, trusting his blind love for her, her boundless power over him, to soon make him forget what might have sounded unpleasant to an English ear. Certainly at the moment he seemed to take it very quietly. Hardly, in fact, did he appear to understand the meaning of all she said. But what was more certain still, was that never after that could she detect the slightest sign of that love which she once believed had been wholly hers. Now they had drifted quite apart, and Sir Percy seemed to have laid aside his love for her, as he would an ill-fitting glove. She tried to rouse him by sharpening her ready wit against his dull intellect, endeavouring to excite his jealousy, if she could not rouse his love, tried to goad him to self-assertion, 
but all in vain. He remained the same, always passive, drawling, sleepy, always courteous, invariably a gentleman. She had all that the world and a wealthy husband can give to a pretty woman. Yet on this beautiful summer's evening, with the white sails of the daydream finally hidden by the evening shadows, she felt more lonely than that poor tramp who plodded his way wearily along the rugged cliffs. With another sigh, Marguerite Blakeney turned her back upon the sea and cliffs, and walked slowly back towards the fisherman's rest. As she drew near, the sound of revelry, of gay, jovial laughter, grew louder and more distinct. She could distinguish Sir Andrew Folk's pleasant voice, Lord Tony's boisterous guffaws, her husband's occasional drawly, sleepy comments. Then, realising the loneliness of the road and the fast-gathering gloom round her, she quickened her steps. The next moment she perceived a stranger coming rapidly towards her. Marguerite did not look up. She was not the least nervous, and the fisherman's rest was now well within call. The stranger paused when he saw Marguerite coming quickly towards him, and just as she was about to slip past him, he said very quietly, Citoyen Saint Just. Marguerite uttered a little cry of astonishment at thus hearing her own familiar maiden name uttered so close to her. She looked up at the stranger, and this time, with a cry of unfeigned pleasure, she put out both her hands effusively towards him. Chauvelin! she exclaimed. Himself, citoyen, at your service, said the stranger, gallantly kissing the tips of her fingers. Marguerite said nothing for a moment or two, as she surveyed with obvious delight the not very prepossessing little figure before her. Chauvelin was then nearer forty than thirty, a clever, shrewd-looking personality, with a curious fox-like expression in the deep, sunken eyes. He was the same stranger who, an hour or two previously, had joined Mr. Jellyband in a friendly glass of wine. "'Chauvelin, my friend,' said Marguerite, with a pretty little sigh of satisfaction, "'I am mightily pleased to see you.' No doubt, poor Marguerite St. Just, lonely in the midst of her grandeur and of her starchy friends, was happy to see a face that brought back memories of that happy time in Paris, when she reigned, a queen, over the intellectual coterie of the Rue de Richelieu. She did not notice the sarcastic little smile, however, that hovered round the thin lips of Chauvelin. "'But tell me,' she added merrily, "'what in the world, or whom in the world, are you doing here in England?' "'I might return the subtle compliment, fair lady,' he said. "'What of yourself?' "'Oh, I,' she said, with a shrug of the shoulders. "'Je m'ennuie, mon ami, that is all.' They had reached the porch of the fisherman's rest, but Marguerite seemed loath to go within. The evening air was lovely after the storm, and she had found a friend who exhaled the breath of Paris, who knew Armand well, who could talk of all the merry, brilliant friends whom she had left behind. So she lingered on under the pretty porch, while through the gaily lighted dormer window of the coffee-room sounds of laughter, of calls for Sally and for beer, of tapping of mugs and clinking of dice, mingled with Sir Percy Blakeney's inane and mirthless laugh. Chauvelin stood beside her, his shrewd, pale, yellow eyes fixed on the pretty face which looked so sweet and childlike in this soft English summer twilight. "'You surprise me, citoyenne,' he said quietly as he took a pinch of snuff. "'Do I now?' she retorted gaily. "'Faith, my little Chauvelin, I should have thought that, with your penetration, you would have guessed that an atmosphere composed of fogs and virtues would never suit Marguerite St. Just.' "'Dear me, is it as bad as that?' he asked, in mock consternation. "'Quite,' she retorted, "'and worse.' "'Strange. Now I thought that a pretty woman would have found English country life peculiarly attractive.' "'Yes, so did I,' she said with a sigh. "'Pretty women,' she added meditatively, "'ought to have a good time in England, "'since all the pleasant things are forbidden them, "'the very things they do every day.' "'Quite so. "'You'll hardly believe it, my little Chauvelin,' "'she said earnestly, "'but I often pass a whole day, a whole day, "'without encountering a single temptation.' "'No wonder,' retorted Chauvelin gallantly, "'that the cleverest woman in Europe is troubled with ennui.' "'She laughed one of her melodious, rippling, childlike laughs. "'It must be pretty bad, mustn't it?' she asked archly, "'or I should not have been so pleased to see you. "'And this within a year of a romantic love-match. "'That's just the difficulty.' "'Ah, that idyllic folly,' said Chauvelin, with quiet sarcasm, "'did not then survive the lapse of weeks?' "'Idyllic follies never last, my little Chauvelin. "'They come upon us like the measles, and are as easily cured.' Chauvelin took another pinch of snuff. He seemed very much addicted to that pernicious habit, so prevalent in those days. 
Perhaps, too, he found the taking of snuff a convenient veil for disguising the quick, shrewd glances with which he strove to read the very souls of those with whom he came in contact. No wonder, he repeated with the same gallantry, that the most active brain in Europe is troubled with ennui. I was in hopes that you had a prescription against the malady, my little Chauvelin. How can I hope to succeed in that which Sir Percy Blakeney has failed to accomplish? Shall we leave Sir Percy out of the question for the present, my dear friend? she said dryly. Ah, my dear lady, pardon me, but that is just what we cannot very well do, said Chauvelin, whilst once again his eyes, keen as those of a fox on the alert, darted a quick glance at Marguerite. I have a most perfect prescription against the worst form of ennui, which I would have been happy to submit to you, but—but but what? There is Sir Percy. What has he to do with it? Quite a good deal, I am afraid. The prescription I would offer, fair lady, is called by a very plebeian name, Work. Work? Chauvelin looked at Marguerite long and scrutinizingly. It seemed as if those keen, pale eyes of his were reading every one of her thoughts. They were alone together. The evening air was quite still, and their soft whispers were drowned in the noise which came from the coffee room. Still, Chauvelin took a step or two from under the porch, looked quickly and keenly all round him, then, seeing that indeed no one was within earshot, he once more came back close to Marguerite. Will you render France a small service, citoyenne? he asked with a sudden change of manner, which lent his thin, fox like face a singular earnestness. La, man, she replied flippantly, how serious you look all of a sudden. Indeed, I do not know if I would render France a small service. At any rate, it depends upon the kind of service she, or you, want. Have you ever heard of the Scarlet Pimpernel, citoyen Saint Just? asked Chauvelin abruptly. Heard of the Scarlet Pimpernel? she retorted with a long and merry laugh. Faith, man, we talk of nothing else. We have hats a la Scarlet Pimpernel, our horses are called Scarlet Pimpernel. At the Prince of Wales' supper party the other night we had a souffle a la Scarlet Pimpernel. Lud, she added gaily, the other day I ordered at my milliner's a blue dress trimmed with green, and bless me if she did not call that a la Scarlet Pimpernel. Chauvelin had not moved while she prattled merrily along. He did not even attempt to stop her when her musical voice and her childlike laugh went echoing through the still evening air. But he remained serious and earnest whilst she laughed, and his voice, clear, incisive, and hard, was not raised above his breath as he said, Then, as you have heard of that enigmatic personage, citoyenne, you must also have guessed, and know, that the man who hides his identity under that strange pseudonym is the most bitter enemy of our Republic of France, of men like Armand Saint Just. La, she said with a quaint little sigh, I dare swear he is. France has many bitter enemies these days. But you, citoyenne, are a daughter of France, and should be ready to help her in a moment of deadly peril. My brother Armand devotes his life to France, she retorted proudly. As for me, I can do nothing here in England. Yes, you, he urged still more earnestly, whilst his thin fox like face seemed suddenly to have grown impressive and full of dignity. Here in England, citoyenne, you alone can help us. Listen. I have been sent over here by the Republican Government as its representative. I present my credentials to Mr. Pitt in London to morrow. One of my duties here is to find out all about this League of the Scarlet Pimpernel, which has become a standing menace to France, since it is pledged to help our cursed aristocrats, traitors to their country and enemies of the people, to escape from the just punishment which they deserve. You know as well as I do, citoyenne, that once they are over here, those French emigres try to rouse public feeling against the Republic. They are ready to join issue with any enemy bold enough to attack France. Now, within the last month, scores of these emigres, some only suspected of treason, others actually condemned by the Tribunal of Public Safety, have succeeded in crossing the Channel. Their escape in each instance was planned, organized, and effected by this society of young English jackanapes, headed by a man whose brain seems as resourceful as his identity is mysterious. All the most strenuous efforts on the part of my spies have failed to discover who he is, whilst the others are the hands, he is the head, who beneath this strange anonymity calmly works at the destruction of France. I mean to strike at that head, and for this I want your help. Through him afterwards I can reach the rest of the gang. He is a young buck in English society, of that I feel sure. Find that man for me, citoyenne, he urged. Find him for France. 
Marguerite had listened to Chauvelin's impassioned speech without uttering a word, scarce making a movement, hardly daring to breathe. She had told him before that this mysterious hero of romance was the talk of the smart set to which she belonged. Already before this, her heart and her imagination had stirred by the thought of the brave man who, unknown to fame, had rescued hundreds of lives from a terrible, often unmerciful fate. She had but little real sympathy with those haughty French aristocrats, insolent in their pride of caste, of whom the Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive was so typical an example. But republican and liberal-minded though she was from principle, she hated and loathed the methods which the young republic had chosen for establishing itself. She had not been in Paris for some months. The horrors and bloodshed of the reign of terror, culminating in the September massacres, had only come across the channel to her as a faint echo. Robespierre, Danton, Marat, she had not known in their new guise of bloody judiciaries, merciless wielders of the guillotine. Her very soul recoiled in horror from these excesses, to which she feared her brother Armand, moderate republican as he was, might become one day the holocaust. Then, when first she heard of this band of young English enthusiasts, who, for sheer love of their fellow-men, dragged women and children, old and young men, from a horrible death, her heart had glowed with pride for them, and now, as Chauvelin spoke, her very soul went out to the gallant and mysterious leader of the reckless little band, who risked his life daily, who gave it freely and without ostentation for the sake of humanity. Her eyes were moist when Chauvelin had finished speaking. The lace at her bosom rose and fell with her quick, excited breathing. She no longer heard the noise of drinking from the inn. She did not heed her husband's voice or his inane laugh. Her thoughts had gone wandering in search of the mysterious hero. Ah, here was a man she might have loved, had he come her way. Everything in him appealed to her romantic imagination. His personality, his strength, his bravery, the loyalty of those who served under him in that same noble cause, and, above all, that anonymity which crowned him, as if with a halo of romantic glory. "'Find him for France, citoyenne!' Chauvelin's voice, close to her ear, roused her from her dreams. The mysterious hero had vanished, and not twenty yards away from her, a man was drinking and laughing, to whom she had sworn faith and loyalty. "'La, man,' she said, with a return of her assumed flippancy, "'you are astonishing. Where in the world am I to look for him?' "'You go everywhere, citoyenne,' whispered Chauvelin, insinuatingly. "'Lady Blakeney is the pivot of social London, so I am told. "'You see everything. You hear everything.' "'Easy, my friend,' retorted Marguerite, drawing herself up to her full height and looking down, with a slight thought of contempt, on the small, thin figure before her. "'Easy. You seem to forget that there are six feet of Sir Percy Blakeney and a long line of ancestors to stand between Lady Blakeney and such a thing as you propose.' "'For the sake of France, citoyenne,' reiterated Chauvelin earnestly. "'Tush, man, you talk nonsense anyway. For even if you did know who this Scarlet Pimpernel is, you could do nothing to him, an Englishman.' "'I'd take my chance of that,' said Chauvelin, with a dry, rasping little laugh. "'At any rate, we could send him to the guillotine first to cool his ardour. Then, when there is a diplomatic fuss about it, we can apologise humbly to the British Government, and, if necessary, pay compensation to the bereaved family. "'What you propose is horrible, Chauvelin,' she said, drawing away from him as from some noisome insect. "'Whoever the man may be, he is brave and noble, and never, do you hear me, never would I lend a hand to such villainy. You prefer to be insulted by every French aristocrat who comes to this country?' Chauvelin had taken sure aim when he shot this tiny shaft. Marguerite's fresh young cheeks became a thought more pale, and she bit her under lip, for she would not let him see that the shaft had struck home. "'That is beside the question,' she said at last, with indifference. "'I can defend myself, but I refuse to do any dirty work for you, or for France. You have other means at your disposal. You must use them, my friend.' And without another look at Chauvelin, Marguerite Blakeney turned her back on him and walked straight into the inn. "'That is not your last word, citoyenne,' said Chauvelin, as a flood of light from the passage illumined her elegant, richly clad figure. "'We meet in London, I hope.' "'We meet in London,' she said, speaking over her shoulder at him. "'But that is my last word.' She threw open the coffee-room door and disappeared from his view. But he remained under the porch for a moment or two, taking a pinch of snuff. He had received a rebuke and a snub but his shrewd, fox-like face looked neither abashed nor disappointed. 
on the contrary, a curious smile, half sarcastic and wholly satisfied, played around the corners of his thin lips. End of chapter 8「The Scarlet Pimpernel」by Baroness Orzee Chapter 9 The Outrage A beautiful starlit night had followed on the day of incessant rain. A cool, balmy, late summer's night, essentially English in its suggestion of moisture and scent of wet earth and dripping leaves. The magnificent coach, drawn by four of the finest thoroughbreds in England, had driven off along the London road, with Sir Percy Blakeney on the box, holding the reins in his slender feminine hands, and beside him Lady Blakeney, wrapped in costly furs. A fifty-mile drive on a starlit summer's night. Marguerite had hailed the notion of it with delight. Sir Percy was an enthusiastic whip. His four thoroughbreds, which had been sent down to Dover a couple of days before, were just sufficiently fresh and restive to add zest to the expedition, and Marguerite revelled in anticipation of the few hours of solitude, with the soft night breeze fanning her cheeks, her thoughts wandering whither away. She knew from old experience that Sir Percy would speak little, if at all. He had often driven her on his beautiful coach for hours at night, from point to point, without making more than one or two casual remarks upon the weather or the state of the roads. He was very fond of driving by night, and she had very quickly adopted his fancy. As she sat next to him hour after hour, admiring the dexterous certain way in which he handled the reins, she often wondered what went on in that slow-going head of his. He never told her, and she had never cared to ask. At the fisherman's rest Mr. Jellyband was going the round, putting out the lights. His bar customers had all gone, but upstairs in the snug little bedrooms Mr. Jellyband had quite a few important guests the Comtesse de Tournay, with Suzanne and the Vicomte, and there were two more bedrooms ready, for Sir Andrew Foulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst, if the two young men should elect to honour the ancient hostelry and stay the night. For the moment these two young gallants were comfortably installed in the coffee-room, before the huge log-fire which, in spite of the mildness of the evening, had been allowed to burn merrily. "'I say, Jelly, has every one gone?' asked Lord Tony, as the worthy landlord still busied himself clearing away glasses and mugs. "'Every one, as you see, my lord. And all your servants gone to bed? All except the boy on duty in the bar, and,' added Mr. Jellyband, with a laugh, "'I expect he'll be asleep before long, the rascal. Then we can talk here undisturbed for half an hour? At your service, my lord. I'll leave your candles on the dresser, and your rooms are quite ready. I sleep at the top of the house myself, but if your lordship will only call loud enough, I dare say I shall hear. All right, Jelly, and, I say, put the lamp out.' The fire'll give us all the light we need, and we don't want to attract the passer-by. All right, my lord?" Mr. Jellyband did as he was bid. He turned out the quaint old lamp that hung from the raftered ceiling, and blew out all the candles. "'Let's have a bottle of wine, Jelly,' suggested Sir Andrew. "'All right, sir?' Jellyband went off to fetch the wine. The room now was quite dark, save for the circle of ruddy and fitful light formed by the brightly blazing logs in the hearth. "'Is that all, gentlemen?' asked Jellyband, as he returned with a bottle of wine and a couple of glasses, which he placed on the table. "'That'll do nicely. Thanks, Jelly,' said Lord Tony. "'Good night, my lord. Good night, sir. Good night, Jelly.' The two young men listened, whilst the heavy tread of Mr. Jellyband was heard echoing along the passage and staircase. Presently even that sound died out, and the whole of the fisherman's rest seemed wrapped in sleep, save the two young men drinking in silence beside the hearth. For a while no sound was heard, even in the coffee-room, save the ticking of the old grandfather's clock and the crackling of the burning wood. "'All right again this time, folks?' asked Lord Antony at last. Sir Andrew had been dreaming, evidently, gazing into the fire, and seeing therein, no doubt, a pretty, piquant face, with large brown eyes and a wealth of dark curls round a childish forehead. "'Yes,' he said, still musing. "'All right. No hitch? None.' Lord Antony laughed pleasantly as he poured himself out another glass of wine. "'I need not ask, I suppose, whether you found the journey pleasant this time.' "'No, friend, you need not ask,' replied Sir Andrew gaily. "'It was all right.' "'Then here's to her very good health,' said jovial Lord Tony. "'She's a bonny lass, though she is a French one. And here's to your courtship. May it flourish and prosper exceedingly.' He drained his glass to the last drop, then joined his friend beside the hearth. "'Well—' "'You'll be doing the journey next, Tony, I expect,' said Sir Andrew, rousing himself from his meditations. 
you and Hastings, certainly, and I hope you may have as pleasant a task as I had, and as charming a travelling companion. You have no idea, Tony. No, I haven't, interrupted his friend pleasantly, but I'll take your word for it. And now, he added, whilst a sudden earnestness crept over his jovial young face, how about business? The two young men drew their chairs closer together, and instinctively, though they were alone, their voices sank to a whisper. I saw the Scarlet Pimpernel alone for a few moments in Calais, said Sir Andrew, a day or two ago. He crossed over to England two days before we did. He had escorted the party all the way from Paris, dressed, you'll never credit it, as an old market woman, and driving, until they were safely out of the city, the covered cart under which the Comtesse de Tournay, Mademoiselle Suzanne, and the Vicomte lay concealed among the turnips and cabbages. They themselves, of course, never suspected who their driver was. He drove them right through a line of soldiery and a yelling mob who were screaming, A bas les aristos! But the market cart got through along with some others, and the scarlet pimpernel, in shawl, petticoat, and hood, yelled, A bas les aristos! louder than anybody. Faith! added the young man as his eyes glowed with enthusiasm for the beloved leader. That man's a marvel! His cheek is preposterous, I vow! And that's what carries him through. Lord Antony, whose vocabulary was more limited than that of his friend, could only find an oath or two with which to show his admiration for his leader. "'He wants you and Hastings to meet him at Calais,' said Sir Andrew, more quietly, "'on the second of next month. Let me see. That will be next Wednesday. Yes. It is, of course, the case of the Comte de Tournay this time, a dangerous task, for the Comte, whose escape from his chateau after he had been declared a suspect by the Committee of Public Safety, was a masterpiece of the Scarlet Pimpernel's ingenuity, is now under sentence of death.' It will be rare sport to get him out of France, and you will have a narrow escape, if you get through at all. Saint-Just has actually gone to meet him. Of course, no one suspects Saint-Just as yet. But after that, to get them both out of the country, in faith, it will be a tough job, and tax even the ingenuity of our chief. I hope I may yet have orders to be of the party. Have you any special instructions for me? Yes, rather more precise ones than usual. It appears that the Republican government have sent an accredited agent over to England, a man named Chauvelin, who is said to be terribly bitter against our League, and determined to discover the identity of our leader, so that he may have him kidnapped the next time he attempts to set foot in France. This Chauvelin has brought a whole army of spies with him, and until the chief has sampled the lot, he thinks we should meet as seldom as possible on the business of the League, and on no account should talk to each other in public places for a time. When he wants to speak to us, he will contrive to let us know." The two young men were both bending over the fire, for the blaze had died down, and only a red glow from the dying embers cast a lurid light on a narrow semicircle in front of the hearth. The rest of the room lay buried in complete gloom. Sir Andrew had taken a pocket-book from his pocket, and drawn therefrom a paper, which he unfolded, and together they tried to read it by the dim red firelight. So intent were they upon this, so wrapped up in the cause, the business they had so much at heart, so precious was this document which came from the very hand of their adored leader, that they had eyes and ears only for that. They lost count of the sounds around them, of the dropping of the crisp ash from the grate, of the monotonous ticking of the clock, of the soft, almost imperceptible rustle of something on the floor close beside them. A figure had emerged from under one of the benches. With snake-like, noiseless movements it crept closer and closer to the young men, not breathing, only gliding along the floor, in the inky blackness of the room. "'You are to read these instructions, and commit them to memory,' said Sir Andrew. "'Then destroy them.' He was about to replace the letter-case into his pocket, when a tiny slip of paper fluttered from it and fell on to the floor. Lord Antony stooped and picked it up. "'What's that?' he asked. "'I don't know,' replied Sir Andrew. It dropped out of your pocket just now. It certainly does not seem to be with the other paper. Strange! I wonder when it got there. It is from the chief," he added, glancing at the paper. Both stooped to try and decipher this last tiny scrap of paper on which a few words had been hastily scrawled, when suddenly a slight noise attracted their attention, which seemed to come from the passage beyond. What's that? said both instinctively. Lord Antony crossed the room towards the door, which he threw open quickly and suddenly. At that very moment he received a stunning blow between the eyes, which threw him back violently into the room. Simultaneously the crouching snake-like figure in the gloom had jumped up and hurled itself from behind the unsuspecting Sir Andrew, felling him to the ground. 
All this occurred within the short space of two or three seconds, and before either Lord Antony or Sir Andrew had time or chance to utter a cry or to make the faintest struggle. They were each seized by two men, a muffler was quickly tied round the mouth of each, and they were pinioned to one another back to back, their arms, hands, and legs securely fastened. One man had, in the meanwhile, quietly shut the door. He wore a mask, and now stood motionless while the others completed their work. "'All safe, citoyen,' said one of the men, as he took a final survey of the bonds which secured the two young men. "'Good,' replied the man at the door. "'Now search their pockets, and give me all the papers you find.' This was promptly and quietly done. The masked man, having taken possession of all the papers, listened for a moment or two if there were any sound within the fisherman's rest. Evidently satisfied that this dastardly outrage had remained unheard, he once more opened the door, and pointed peremptorily down the passage. The four men lifted Sir Andrew and Lord Antony from the ground, and as quietly, as noiselessly as they had come, they bore the two pinioned young gallants out of the inn and along the Dover Road into the gloom beyond. In the coffee-room the masked leader of this daring attempt was quickly glancing through the stolen papers. "'Not a bad day's work on the whole,' he muttered, as he quietly took off his mask, and his pale fox-like eyes glittered in the red glow of the fire. "'Not a bad day's work.' He opened one or two letters from Sir Andrew Folk's pocket-book, noted the tiny scrap of paper which the two young men had only just had time to read. But one letter specifically, signed Armand Saint-Just, seemed to give him strange satisfaction. "'Armand Saint-Just, a traitor after all,' he murmured. "'Now, fair Marguerite Blakeney,' he added viciously between his clenched teeth, "'I think that you will help me to find the Scarlet Pimpernel.'" End of chapter 9「The Scarlet Pimpernel » by Baroness Orzy CHAPTER Ten, IN THE OPERA BOX It was one of the gala nights at Covent Garden Theatre, the first of the autumn season in this memorable year of grace, 1792. The house was well packed, both in the smart orchestra boxes and in the pit, as well as in the more plebeian balconies and galleries above. Gluck's Orpheus made a strong appeal to the more intellectual portions of the house, whilst the fashionable women, the gaily dressed and brilliant throng, spoke to the eye of those who cared but little for this latest importation from Germany. Selina Storis had been duly applauded after her grand aria by her numerous admirers. Benjamin Inkledon, the acknowledged favourite of the ladies, had received special gracious recognition from the royal box, and now the curtain came down after the glorious finale to the second act, and the audience, which had hung spellbound on the magic strains of the great maestro, seemed collectively to breathe a long sigh of satisfaction, previous to letting loose its hundreds of waggish and frivolous tongues. In the smart orchestra boxes many well-known faces were to be seen. Mr. Pitt, overweighted with cares of state, was finding brief relaxation in tonight's musical treat. The Prince of Wales, jovial, rotund, somewhat coarse and commonplace in appearance, moved about from box to box, spending brief quarters of an hour with those of his more intimate friends. In Lord Grenville's box, too, a curious, interesting personality attracted every one's attention. A thin, small figure, with shrewd, sarcastic face and deep-set eyes, attentive to the music, keenly critical of the audience, dressed in immaculate black, with dark hair free from any powder. Lord Grenville, Foreign Secretary of State, paid him marked, though frigid, deference. Here and there, dotted about among distinctly English types of beauty, one or two foreign faces stood out in marked contrast. The haughty, aristocratic cast of countenance of the many French royalist émigrés who, persecuted by the relentless revolutionary faction of their country, had found a peaceful refuge in England. On these faces sorrow and care were deeply writ. The women especially paid but little heed, either to the music or to the brilliant audience. No doubt their thoughts were far away with husband, brother, son maybe, still in peril, or lately succumbed to a cruel fate. Among these, the Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive, but lately arrived from France, was a most conspicuous figure, dressed in deep, heavy black silk, with only a white lace handkerchief to relieve the aspect of mourning about her person. She sat beside Lady Portals, who was vainly trying, by witty sallies and somewhat broad jokes, to bring a smile to the Comtesse's sad mouth. Behind her sat little Suzanne and the Vicomte, both silent and somewhat shy among so many strangers. Suzanne's eyes seemed wistful. 
When she first entered the crowded house, she had looked eagerly all around, scanning every face, scrutinized every box. Evidently, the one face she wished to see was not there, for she settled herself quietly behind her mother, listened apathetically to the music, and took no further interest in the audience itself. Ah, Lord Grenville! said Lady Portals, as, following a discreet knock, the clever, interesting head of the Secretary of State appeared in the doorway of the box. You could not arrive more apropos. Here is Madame la Comtesse de Tournay positively dying to hear the latest news from France. The distinguished diplomat had come forward and was shaking hands with the ladies. Alas, he said sadly, it is of the very worst. The massacres continue. Paris literally reeks with blood, and the guillotine claims a hundred victims a day. Pale and tearful, the Comtesse was leaning back in her chair, listening horror struck to this brief and graphic account of what went on in her own misguided country. Ah, monsieur, she said in broken English, it is dreadful to hear all that, and my poor husband still in that awful country. It is terrible for me to be sitting here in a theatre, all safe and in peace, while he is in such peril. Lud, madame, said honest, bluff Lady Portals. Your sitting in a convent won't make your husband safe, and you have your children to consider. They are too young to be dosed with anxiety in premature mourning. The Comtesse smiled through her tears at the vehemence of her friend. Lady Portals, whose voice and manner would not have misfitted a jockey, had a heart of gold, and hid the most genuine sympathy and most gentle kindliness beneath the somewhat coarse manners affected by some ladies at that time. Besides which, madame, added Lord Grenville, did you not tell me yesterday that the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel had pledged their honour to bring Monsieur le Comte safely across the Channel? Ah, yes, replied the Comtesse, and that is my only hope. I saw Lord Hastings yesterday. He reassured me again. Then I am sure you need have no fear. What the League have sworn, that they will surely accomplish. Ah, added the old diplomat with a sigh, if I were but a few years younger. La, man, interrupted honest Lady Portals, you are still young enough to turn your back on that French scarecrow that sits enthroned in your box to night. I wish I could. But your ladyship must remember that in serving our country we must put prejudices aside. Monsieur Chauvelin is the accredited agent of his government. Odds fish, man, she retorted. You don't call those bloodthirsty ruffians over there a government, do you? It has not been thought advisable as yet, said the minister, guardedly, for England to break off diplomatic relations with France, and we cannot therefore refuse to receive with courtesy the agents she wishes to send to us. Diplomatic relations be damned, my lord. That sly little fox over there is nothing but a spy, I'll warrant, and you'll find, and I'm much mistaken, that he'll concern himself little with such diplomacy beyond trying to do mischief to royalist refugees, to our heroic Scarlet Pimpernel, and to the members of that brave little league. I am sure, said the Comtesse, pursing up her thin lips, that if this Chauvelin wishes to do us mischief, he will find a faithful ally in Lady Blakeney. Bless the woman, ejaculated Lady Portals. Did ever any one see such perversity? My Lord Grenville, you have the gift of gab. Will you please explain to Madame la Comtesse that she is acting like a fool? In your position here in England, Madame, she added, turning a wrathful and resolute face toward the Comtesse, you cannot afford to put on the hoity toity airs you French aristocrats are so fond of. Lady Blakeney may or may not be in sympathy with those ruffians in France. She may or may not have had anything to do with the arrest and condemnation of Saint Cyr, or whatever the man's name is. But she is the leader of fashion in this country. Sir Percy Blakeney has more money than any half-dozen other men put together. He is hand in glove with royalty, and your trying to snub Lady Blakeney will not harm her, but will make you look a fool. Isn't that so, my lord? But what Lord Grenville thought of this matter, or to what reflections this comely tirade of Lady Portal's led the Comtesse de Tournay, remained unspoken, for the curtain had just risen on the third act of Orpheus, and admonishments to silence came from every part of the house. Lord Grenville took a hasty farewell of the ladies, and slipped back into his box, where Monsieur Chauvelin had sat through this entracte, with his eternal snuff-box in his hand, and with his keen pale eyes intently fixed upon a box opposite him, where, with much frou-frou of silken skirts, much laughter and general stare of curiosity amongst the audience, Marguerite Blakeney had just entered, accompanied by her husband, and looking divinely pretty beneath the wealth of her golden reddish curls, slightly besprinkled with powder, and tied back at the nape of her graceful neck with a gigantic black bow. 
Always dressed in the very latest vagary of fashion, Marguerite alone among the ladies that night had discarded the crossover fichu and broad lapelled overdress which had been in fashion for the last two or three years. She wore the short waisted classical shaped gown, which so soon was to become the approved mode in every country in Europe. It suited her graceful, regal figure to perfection, composed as it was of shimmering stuff which seemed a mass of rich gold embroidery. As she entered, she leant for a moment out of the box, taking stock of all those present whom she knew. Many bowed to her as she did so, and from the royal box there came also a quick and gracious salute. Chauvelin watched her intently all through the commencement of the third act, as she sat enthralled with the music, her exquisite little hand toying with a small jewelled fan, her regal head, her throat, arms, and neck, covered with magnificent diamonds and rare gems, the gift of the adoring husband who sprawled leisurely by her side. Marguerite was passionately fond of music. Orpheus charmed her to night. The very joy of living was writ plainly upon the sweet young face. It sparkled out of the merry blue eyes and lit up the smile that lurked around the lips. She was, after all, but five and twenty, in the heyday of youth, the darling of a brilliant throng, adored, fated, petted, cherished. Two days ago the daydream had returned from Calais, bringing her news that her idolized brother had safely landed, that he thought of her, and would be prudent for her sake. What wonder for the moment, and listening to Gluck's impassioned strains, that she forgot her disillusionments, forgot her vanished love dreams, forgot even the lazy, good humoured nonentity who had made up for his lack of spiritual attainments by lavishing worldly advantages upon her. He had stayed beside her in the box just as long as convention demanded, making way for His Royal Highness and for the host of admirers who, in a continued procession, came to pay homage to the Queen of Fashion. Sir Percy had strolled away, to talk to more congenial friends, probably. Marguerite did not even wonder whither he had gone. She cared so little. She had had a little court round her, composed of the jeunesse dorée of London, and had just dismissed them all, wishing to be alone with Gluck for a brief while. A discreet knock at the door roused her from her enjoyment. "'Come in,' she said with some impatience, without turning to look at the intruder. Chauvelin, waiting for his opportunity, noted that she was alone, and now, without pausing for that impatient to come in, he quietly slipped into the box, and the next moment was standing behind Marguerite's chair. "'A word with you, citoyenne,' he said quietly. Marguerite turned quickly, in alarm which was not altogether feigned. "'Lud, man, you frightened me,' she said, with a forced little laugh. "'Your presence is entirely inopportune. "'I want to listen to Gluck, and have no mind for talking.' "'But this is my only opportunity,' he said, as, quietly, and without waiting for permission, he drew a chair close behind her, so close that he could whisper in her ear without disturbing the audience, and without being seen, in the dark background of the box. "'This is my only opportunity,' he repeated, as she vouchsafed him no reply. "'Lady Blakeney is always so surrounded, so fated by her court, that a mere old friend has but very little chance. "'Faith, man,' she said impatiently, "'you must seek for another opportunity, then. "'I am going to Lord Grenville's ball to-night after the opera. "'So are you, probably. "'I'll give you five minutes, then.' Three minutes, in the privacy of this box, are quite sufficient for me,' he rejoined placidly. "'And I think that you will be wise to listen to me, citoyenne sans juste.' Marguerite instinctively shivered. Chauvelin had not raised his voice above a whisper. He was now quietly taking a pinch of snuff. Yet there was something in his attitude, something in those pale foxy eyes, which seemed to freeze the blood in her veins, as would the sight of some deadly, hitherto unguessed peril. "'Is that a threat, citoyen?' she asked at last. "'Nay, fair lady,' he said gallantly, "'only an arrow shot into the air.' He paused a moment, like a cat which sees a mouse running heedlessly by, ready to spring, yet waiting with that feline sense of enjoyment of mischief about to be done. Then he said quietly, "'Your brother, Saint Just, is in peril.' Not a muscle moved in the beautiful face before him. He could only see it in profile, for Marguerite seemed to be watching the stage intently. But Chauvelin was a keen observer. He noticed the sudden rigidity of the eyes, the hardening of the mouth, the sharp, almost paralysed tension of the beautiful, graceful figure. "'Lad, then,' she said, with affected merriment, "'since tis one of your imaginary plots, you'd best go back to your own seat and leave me enjoy the music.' And with her hand she began to beat time nervously against the cushion of the box. Selina Storis was singing the Gefaro to an audience that hung spellbound upon the prima donna's lips. Chauvelin did not move from his seat. He quietly watched that tiny, nervous hand— the only indication that his shaft had indeed struck home. 
"'Well?' she said suddenly and irrelevantly, and with the same feigned unconcern. "'Well, citoyenne?' he rejoined placidly. "'About my brother?' "'I have news of him for you, which, I think, will interest you. But first, let me explain. May I?' The question was unnecessary. He felt, though Marguerite still held her head steadily averted from him, that her every nerve was strained to hear what he had to say. "'The other day, citoyenne,' he said, "'I asked for your help. France needed it, and I thought I could rely on you, but you gave me your answer. Since then the exigencies of my own affairs and your own social duties have kept us apart, although many things have happened. To the point I pray you, citoyen,' she said lightly, "'the music is entrancing, and the audience will get impatient of your talk. One moment, citoyen. The day on which I had the honour of meeting you at Dover, and less than an hour after I had your final answer, I obtained possession of some papers, which revealed another of those subtle schemes for the escape of a batch of French aristocrats, that traitor de Tournay amongst others, all organised by that arch-meddler the Scarlet Pimpernel. Some of the threads, too, of this mysterious organisation have come into my hands, but not all, and I want you, nay, you must help me to gather them together." Marguerite seemed to have listened to him with marked impatience. She now shrugged her shoulders and said gaily, "'Bah, man! Have I not already told you that I care not about your schemes or about the Scarlet Pimpernel? And had you not spoken about my brother—a little patience, I entreat, citoyenne,' he continued imperturbably. Two gentlemen, Lord Antony Dewhurst and Sir Andrew Foulkes, were at the Fisherman's Rest at Dover that same night. I know, I saw them there. They were already known to my spies as members of that accursed league. It was Sir Andrew Foulkes who escorted the Comtesse de Tournay and her children across the Channel. When the two young men were alone, my spies forced their way into the coffee-room of the inn, gagged and pinioned the two gallants, seized their papers, and brought them to me. In a moment she had guessed the danger. Papers! Had Armand been imprudent? The very thought struck her with nameless terror. Still, she would not let this man see that she feared. She laughed gaily and lightly. "'Faith! And your impudence passes belief,' she said merrily. "'Robbery and violence! In England! In a crowded inn! Your men might have been caught in the act. What if they had? They are children of France, and they have been trained by your humble servant. Had they been caught, they would have gone to jail, or even to the gallows, without a word of protest or indiscretion. At any rate, it was well worth the risk. A crowded inn is safer for those little operations than you think, and my men have experience." "'Well, and those papers?' she asked carelessly. "'Unfortunately, though they have given me cognizance of certain names, certain movements, enough, I think, to thwart their projected coup for the moment, it would only be for the moment, and still leaves me in ignorance of the identity of the Scarlet Pimpernel." "'La, my friend,' she said with the same assumed flippancy of manner, "'then you are where you were before, aren't you? and you can let me enjoy the last trough of the aria. "'Faith!' she added, ostentatiously smothering an imaginary yawn. "'Had you not spoken about my brother? I am coming to him now, citoyenne. Among the papers there was a letter to Sir Andrew Foulkes, written by your brother Saint-Just. Well? And? That letter shows him to be not only in sympathy with the enemies of France, but actually a helper, if not a member, of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel.' The blow had been struck at last. All along Marguerite had been expecting it. She would not show fear. She was determined to seem unconcerned, flippant even. She wished, when the shock came, to be prepared for it, to have all her wits about her, those wits which had been nicknamed the keenest in Europe. Even now she did not flinch. She knew that Chauvelin had spoken the truth. The man was too earnest, too blindly devoted to the misguided cause he had at heart, too proud of his countrymen of those makers of revolutions, to stoop to low, purposeless falsehoods. That letter of Armand's, foolish, imprudent Armand, was in Chauvelin's hands. Marguerite knew that as if she had seen the letter with her own eyes, and Chauvelin would hold that letter for purposes of his own, until it suited him to destroy it, or to make use of it against Armand. All that she knew, and yet she continued to laugh more gaily, more loudly, than she had done before. <laughs> Armand! she said, speaking over her shoulder and looking him full and squarely in the face. Did I not say it was some imaginary plot? Armand in league with that enigmatic Scarlet Pimpernel? Armand busy helping those French aristocrats whom he despises? Faith! The tale does infinite credit to your imagination!" 
"'Let me make my point clear, citoyenne,' said Chauvelin, with the same unruffled calm. "'I must assure you that Saint-Just is compromised beyond the slightest hope of pardon.' Outside the orchestra-box all were silent for a moment or two. Marguerite sat straight upright, rigid and inert, trying to think, trying to face the situation, to realise what had best be done. In the house, Storis had finished the aria, and was even now bowing in her classic garb, but in approved eighteenth-century fashion, to the enthusiastic audience who cheered her to the echo. Chauvelin, said Marguerite Blakeney at last, quietly, and without that touch of bravado which had characterised her attitude all along. Chauvelin, my friend, shall we try to understand one another? It seems that my wits have become rusty by contact with this damp climate. Now tell me, you are very anxious to discover the identity of the Scarlet Pimpernel, isn't that so? France's most bitter enemy, citoyenne, all the more dangerous as he works in the dark. All the more noble, you mean. Well, and you would now force me to do some spying work for you in exchange for my brother Armand's safety, is that it? Fie! Two very ugly words, fair lady, protested Chauvelin urbanely. There can be no question of force— and the service which I would ask of you in the name of France could never be called by the shocking name of spying. At any rate, that is what it is called over here, she said dryly. That is your intention, is it not? My intention is that you yourself win the free pardon for Armand Saint Just by doing me a small service. What is it? Only watch for me to night, Citoyen Saint Just, he said eagerly. Listen. Among the papers which were found about the person of Sir Andrew Foulkes, there was a tiny note. See, he added, taking a tiny scrap of paper from his pocket-book and handing it to her. It was the same scrap of paper which, four days ago, the two young men had been in the act of reading at the very moment when they were attacked by Chauvelin's minions. Marguerite took it mechanically and stooped to read it. There were only two lines, written in a distorted, evidently disguised handwriting. She read them half aloud. "'Remember we must not meet more often than is strictly necessary. You have all instructions for the second. If you wish to speak to me again, I shall be at G.'s ball.' "'What does it mean?' she asked. "'Look again, citoyenne, and you will understand. "'There is a device here in the corner, a small red flower.' "'Yes.' "'The Scarlet Pimpernel,' she said eagerly. "'And G.'s ball means Grenville's ball. He will be at my Lord Grenville's ball to-night.' "'That is how I interpret the note, citoyenne,' concluded Chauvelin blandly. "'Lord Antony Dewhurst and Sir Andrew Foulkes, after they were pinioned and searched by my spies, were carried by my orders to a lonely house in the Dover Road, which I had rented for the purpose. There they remained close prisoners until this morning. But having found this tiny scrap of paper, my intention was that they should be in London in time to attend my Lord Grenville's ball. You see, do you not, that they must have a great deal to say to their chief, and thus— they will have an opportunity of speaking to him to-night, just as he directed them to do. Therefore, this morning, those two young gallants found every bar and bolt open in that lonely house on the Dover Road, their jailers disappeared, and two good horses standing ready saddled and tethered in the yard. I have not seen them yet, but I think we may safely conclude that they did not draw rein until they reached London. Now you see how simple it all is, citoyenne. It does seem simple, doesn't it? she said, with a final bitter attempt at flippancy. When you want to kill a chicken, you take hold of it, then you wring its neck. It's only the chicken who does not find it quite so simple. Now you hold a knife at my throat, and a hostage for my obedience. You find it simple. I don't. Nay, citoyenne, I offer you a chance of saving the brother you love from the consequences of his own folly. Marguerite's face softened. Her eyes at last grew moist, as she murmured half to herself— the only being in the world who has loved me truly and constantly. "'But what do you want me to do, Chauvelin?' she said, with a world of despair in her tear-choked voice. "'In my present position it is well-nigh impossible.' "'Nay, citoyenne,' he said dryly and relentlessly, not heeding that despairing, childlike appeal, which might have melted a heart of stone. "'As Lady Blakeney no one suspects you, and with your help to-night I may—who knows—succeed in finally establishing the identity of the Scarlet Pimpernel.' "'You are going to the ball anon. Watch for me there. Watch and listen. You can tell me if you hear a chance word or whisper. You can note every one to whom Sir Andrew Foulkes or Lord Antony Dewhurst will speak. You are absolutely beyond suspicion now. The Scarlet Pimpernel will be at Lord Grenville's ball to-night. Find out who he is, and I will pledge the word of France that your brother shall be safe.' Chauvelin was putting the knife to her throat. 
Marguerite felt herself entangled in one of those webs from which she could hope for no escape. A precious hostage was being held for her obedience, for she knew that this man would never make an empty threat. No doubt Armand was already signalled to the Committee of Public Safety as one of the suspect. He would not be allowed to leave France again, and would be ruthlessly struck if she refused to obey Chauvelin. For a moment, womanlike, she still hoped to temporise. She held out her hand to this man, whom she now feared and hated. If I promise to help you in this matter, Chauvelin, she said pleasantly, will you give me that letter of Saint Just's? If you render me useful service to night, citoyenne, he replied with a sarcastic smile, I will give you that letter to morrow. You do not trust me? I trust you absolutely, dear lady. But Saint Just's life is forfeit to his country. It rests with you to redeem it. I may be powerless to help you, she pleaded. Were I ever so willing? That would be terrible indeed, he said quietly, for you and for Saint Just. Marguerite shuddered. She felt that from this man she could expect no mercy. All powerful, he held the beloved life in the hollow of his hand. She knew him too well not to know that if he failed in gaining his own ends, he would be pitiless. She felt cold in spite of the oppressive air of the opera house. The heart-appealing strains of the music seemed to reach her as from a distant land. She drew her costly lace scarf up around her shoulders and sat silently, watching the brilliant scene as if in a dream. For a moment, her thoughts wandered away from the loved one who was in danger to that other man who also had a claim on her confidence and her affection. She felt lonely, frightened for Armand's sake. She longed to seek comfort and advice from someone who would know how to help and console. Sir Percy Blakeney had loved her once. He was her husband. Why should she stand alone through this terrible ordeal? He had very little brains, it is true, but he had plenty of muscle. Surely, if she provided the thought and he the manly energy and pluck, together they could outwit the astute diplomatist and save the hostage from his vengeful hands without imperilling the life of the noble leader of that gallant little band of heroes. Sir Percy knew Saint Just well. He seemed attached to him. She was sure that he could help. Chauvelin was taking no further heed of her. He had said his cruel either or and left her to decide. He, in his turn now, appeared to be absorbed in the soul stirring melodies of Orpheus, and was beating time to the music with his sharp, ferret like head. A discreet rap at the door roused Marguerite from her thoughts. It was Sir Percy Blakeney, tall, sleepy, good humoured, and wearing that half shy, half inane smile which just now seemed to irritate her every nerve. Er,、uh, your chair is outside, my dear. He said with his most exasperating drawl, I suppose you will want to go to that demmed ball. Excuse me,、uh, Monsieur Chauvelin, I had not observed you. He extended two slender white fingers toward Chauvelin, who had risen when Sir Percy entered the box. Are you coming, my dear? Hush! Shh! Shh! came in angry remonstrance from different parts of the house. Demmed impudence! commented Sir Percy with a good natured smile. Marguerite sighed impatiently. Her last hopes seemed suddenly to have vanished away. She wrapped her cloak around her, and without looking at her husband, I am ready to go, she said, taking his arm. At the door of the box she turned and looked straight at Chauvelin, who, with his chapeau bras under his arm, and a curious smile round his thin lips, was preparing to follow the strangely ill assorted couple. It is only au revoir, Chauvelin, she said pleasantly. We shall meet at my lord Grenville's ball anon. And in her eyes the astute Frenchman read, no doubt, something which caused him profound satisfaction. For with a sarcastic smile, he took a delicate pinch of snuff. Then, having dusted his dainty laced jabot, he rubbed his thin, bony hands contentedly together. End of chapter ten. The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzy. Chapter eleven. Lord Grenville's Ball. The historic ball given by the then Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Grenville, was the most brilliant function of the year. Though the autumn season had only just begun, everybody who was anybody had contrived to be in London in time to be present there, and to shine at this ball, to the best of his or her respective ability. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales had promised to be present. He was coming on presently from the opera. Lord Grenville himself had listened to the first two acts of Orpheus before preparing to receive his guests. At ten o'clock, an unusually late hour in those days, the grand rooms of the Foreign Office, exquisitely decorated with exotic palms and flowers, were filled to overflowing. 
One room had been set apart for dancing, and the dainty strains of the minuet made a soft accompaniment to the gay chatter, the merry laughter of the numerous and brilliant company. In a smaller chamber, facing the top of the fine stairway, the distinguished host stood ready to receive his guests. Distinguished men, beautiful women, notabilities from every European country had already filed past him, had exchanged the elaborate bows and curtsies with him, which the extravagant fashion of the time demanded, and then, laughing and talking, had dispersed into the hall, reception, and card rooms beyond. Not far from Lord Grenville's elbow, leaning against one of the console tables, Chauvelin, in his irreproachable black costume, was taking a quiet survey of the brilliant throng. He noted that Sir Percy and Lady Blakeney had not yet arrived, and his keen, pale eyes glanced quickly towards the door every time a newcomer appeared. He stood somewhat isolated. The envoy of the revolutionary government of France was not likely to be very popular in England, at a time when the news of the awful September massacres, and of the reign of terror and anarchy, had just begun to filtrate across the Channel. In his official capacity he had been received courteously by his English colleagues. Mr. Pitt had shaken him by the hand, Lord Grenville had entertained him more than once, but the more intimate circles of London society ignored him altogether. The women openly turned their backs upon him. The men who held no official position refused to shake his hand. But Chauvelin was not the man to trouble himself about these social amenities, which he called mere incidents in his diplomatic career. He was blindly enthusiastic for the revolutionary cause, he despised all social inequalities, and he had a burning love for his own country. These three sentiments made him supremely indifferent to the snubs he received in this fog-ridden, loyalist, old-fashioned England. But above all, Chauvelin had a purpose at heart. He firmly believed that the French aristocrat was the most bitter enemy of France. He would have wished to see every one of them annihilated. He was one of those who, during this awful reign of terror, had been the first to utter the historic and ferocious desire that aristocrats might have but one head between them, so that it might be cut off with a single stroke of the guillotine. And thus he looked upon every French aristocrat, who had succeeded in escaping from France, as so much prey of which the guillotine had been unwarrantably cheated. There is no doubt that those royalist émigrés, once they had managed to cross the frontier, did their very best to stir up foreign indignation against France. Plots without end were hatched in England, in Belgium, in Holland, to try and induce some great power to send troops into revolutionary Paris, to free King Louis, and to summarily hang the bloodthirsty leaders of that monster republic. Small wonder, therefore, that the romantic and mysterious personality of the Scarlet Pimpernel was a source of bitter hatred to Chauvelin. He and the few young jackanapes under his command, well furnished with money, armed with boundless daring and acute cunning, had succeeded in rescuing hundreds of aristocrats from France. Nine-tenths of the émigrés who were fated at the English court owed their safety to that man and to his league. Chauvelin had sworn to his colleagues in Paris that he would discover the identity of that meddlesome Englishman, entice him over to France, and then— Chauvelin drew a deep breath of satisfaction at the very thought of seeing that enigmatic head falling under the knife of the guillotine as easily as that of any other man. Suddenly there was a great stir on the handsome staircase. All conversation stopped for a moment as the major-domo's voice outside announced, "'His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and sweet, Sir Percy Blakeney, Lady Blakeney.' Lord Grenville went quickly to the door to receive his exhorted guest. The Prince of Wales, dressed in a magnificent court suit of salmon-coloured velvet, richly embroidered with gold, entered with Marguerite Blakeney on his arm, and on his left Sir Percy, in gorgeous shimmering cream satin, cut in the extravagant, incroyable style, his fair hair free from powder, priceless lace at his neck and wrists, and the flat chapeau bras under his arm. After the few conventional words of deferential greeting, Lord Grenville said to his royal guest, "'Will your Highness permit me to introduce Monsieur Chauvelin, the accredited agent of the French government?' Chauvelin, immediately the Prince entered, had stepped forward, expecting this introduction. He bowed very low, whilst the Prince returned his salute with a curt nod of the head. "'Monsieur,' said His Royal Highness coldly, "'we will try to forget the government that sent you, and look upon you merely as our guest, a private gentleman from France. As such, you are welcome, Monsieur.' "'Monseigneur,' rejoined Chauvelin, bowing once again, Madame, he added, bowing ceremoniously before Marguerite. Ah, my little Chauvelin, she said with unconcerned gaiety, and extending her tiny hand to him. Monsieur and I are old friends, your Royal Highness. Ah, then, said the Prince, this time very graciously, you are doubly welcome, Monsieur. There is someone else I would crave permission to present to your Royal Highness, here interposed Lord Grenville. Ah, 
"'Who is it?' asked the prince. "'Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive and her family, who have but recently come from France. "'By all means, they are among the lucky ones, then.' Lord Grenville turned in search of the Comtesse, who sat at the further end of the room. "'Lord love me,' whispered His Royal Highness to Marguerite, as soon as he had caught sight of the frigid figure of the old lady. "'Lord love me, she looks very virtuous and very melancholy.' "'Faith, your Royal Highness,' she rejoined with a smile, "'virtue is like precious odours, most fragrant when it is crushed.' "'Virtue, alas,' sighed the Prince, "'is mostly unbecoming to your charming sex, madame.' "'Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive, said Lord Grenville, introducing the lady. "'This is a pleasure, madame. My royal father, as you know, is ever glad to welcome those of your compatriots whom France has driven from her shores.' "'Your Royal Highness is ever gracious,' replied the Comtesse, with becoming dignity. Then, indicating her daughter, who stood timidly by her side, "'My daughter Suzanne, Monseigneur,' she said. "'Ah, charming, charming,' said the Prince. "'And now allow me, Comtesse, to introduce you, Lady Blakeney, who honours us with her friendship. You and she will have much to say to one another, I vow. Every compatriot of Lady Blakeney's is doubly welcome for her sake. Her friends are our friends, her enemies, the enemies of England.' Marguerite's blue eyes had twinkled with merriment at this gracious speech from her exalted friend. The Comtesse de Tournay, who lately had so flagrantly insulted her, was here receiving a public lesson, at which Marguerite could not help but rejoice. But the Comtesse, for whom respect of royalty amounted almost to a religion, was too well schooled in courtly etiquette to show the slightest sign of embarrassment, as the two ladies curtsied ceremoniously to one another. "'His Royal Highness is ever gracious, madame,' said Marguerite demurely, and with a wealth of mischief in her twinkling blue eyes. "'But there is no need for his kind of meditation. Your amiable reception of me at our last meeting still dwells pleasantly in my memory.' "'We poor exiles, madame,' rejoined the Comtesse frittedly, "'show our gratitude to England by devotion to the wishes of Monseigneur.' "'Madame,' said Marguerite, with another ceremonious curtsy, "'Madame,' responded the Comtesse, with equal dignity. The Prince, in the meanwhile, was saying a few gracious words to the young Vicomte. "'I am happy to know you, Monsieur le Vicomte,' he said. "'I knew your father well when he was ambassador in London.' "'Ah, Monseigneur,' replied the Vicomte, "'I was a little boy then, and now I owe the honour of this meeting to our protector, the Scarlet Pimpernel.' "'Hush!' said the Prince, earnestly and quickly, as he indicated Chauvelin, who had stood a little on one side throughout the whole of this little scene, watching Marguerite and the Comtesse with an amused, sarcastic little smile around his thin lips. "'Nay, Monseigneur,' he said now, as if in direct response to the Prince's challenge, "'pray do not check this gentleman's display of gratitude. The name of that interesting red flower is well known to me, and to France.' The Prince looked at him keenly for a moment or two. "'Faith, then, Monsieur,' he said, Perhaps you know more about our national hero than we do ourselves. Perchance you know who he is. See, he added, turning to the groups round the room, the ladies hang upon your lips. You would render yourself popular among the fair sex if you were to gratify their curiosity. Ah, Monseigneur, said Chauvelin significantly, rumour has it in France that your Highness could, and you would, give the truest account of that enigmatical wayside flower. He looked quickly and keenly at Marguerite as he spoke. But she betrayed no emotion, and her eyes met his quite fearlessly. "'Nay, man,' replied the Prince, "'my lips are sealed, and the members of the League jealously guard the secret of their chief, so his fair adorers have to be content with worshipping a shadow. Here in England, monsieur,' he added, with wonderful charm and dignity, "'we but name the Scarlet Pimpernel, and every fair cheek is suffused with a blush of enthusiasm. None have seen him save his faithful lieutenants. We know not if he be tall or short, fair or dark.' handsome or ill-formed, but we know that he is the bravest gentleman in all the world, and we all feel a little proud, monsieur, when we remember that he is an Englishman. "'Ah, Monsieur Chauvelin,' added Marguerite, looking almost with defiance across at the placid, sphinx-like face of the Frenchman, "'His Royal Highness should add that we ladies think of him as of a hero of old. We worship him, we wear his badge, we tremble for him when he is in danger, and exult with him in the hour of his victory.' Chauvelin did no more than bow placidly, both to the Prince and to Marguerite. He felt that both speeches were intended, each in their way, to convey contempt or defiance. The pleasure-loving, idle Prince he despised. The beautiful woman, who in her golden hair wore a spray of small red flowers composed of rubies and diamonds, her he held in the hollow of hand. He could afford to remain silent, and to wait events." A long, jovial, inane laugh broke the sudden silence which had fallen over everyone. 
"'And we poor husbands,' came in slow, affected accents from gorgeous Sir Percy, "'we have to stand by, while they worship a demmed shadow.' Every one laughed, the prince more loudly than any one. The tension of subdued excitement was relieved, and the next moment every one was laughing and chatting merrily as the gay crowd broke up and dispersed in the adjoining rooms. End of chapter 11「The Scarlet Pimpernel」by Baroness Orzy Chapter Twelve: The Scrap of Paper Marguerite suffered intensely. Though she laughed and chatted, though she was more admired, more surrounded, more fated than any woman there, she felt like one condemned to death, living her last day upon this earth. Her nerves were in a state of painful tension, which had increased a hundredfold during that brief hour which she had spent in her husband's company, between the opera and the ball. The short ray of hope, that she might find in this good-natured, lazy individual a valuable friend and adviser, had vanished as quickly as it had come, the moment she found herself alone with him. The same feeling of good-humoured contempt which one feels for an animal or a faithful servant, made her turn away with a smile from the man who should have been her moral support in this heart-rending crisis through which she was passing, who should have been her cool-headed adviser when feminine sympathy and sentiment tossed her hither and thither between her love for her brother, who was far away and in mortal peril, and horror of the awful service which Chauvelin had exacted from her, in exchange for our man's safety. There he stood, the moral support, the cool-headed adviser, surrounded by a crowd of brainless, empty-headed young fops, who were even now repeating from mouth to mouth, and with every sign of the keenest enjoyment, a dog-roll quatrain which he had just given forth. Everywhere the absurd, silly words met her. People seemed to have little else to speak about. Even the prince had asked her, with a little laugh, whether she appreciated her husband's latest poetic efforts. "'All done in the tying of a cravat,' Sir Percy had declared to his clique of admirers. "'We seek him here, we seek him there. Those Frenchies seek him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? That demmed elusive Pimpernel!' Sir Percy's bon mot had gone the round of the brilliant reception-rooms. The prince was enchanted. He vowed that life without Blakeney would be but a dreary desert then, taking him by the arm, had led him to the card-room, and engaged him in a long game of hazard. Sir Percy, whose chief interest in most social gatherings seemed to centre around the card-table, usually allowed his wife to flirt, dance, to amuse or bore herself as much as she liked. And to-night, having delivered himself of his bon mot, he had left Marguerite surrounded by a crowd of admirers of all ages, all anxious and willing to help her to forget that somewhere in the spacious reception-rooms there was a long, lazy being who had been fool enough to suppose that the cleverest woman in Europe would settle down to the prosaic bonds of English matrimony. Her still overwrought nerves, her excitement and agitation, lent beautiful Marguerite Blakeney much additional charm. Escorted by a veritable bevy of men of all ages, and of most nationalities, she called forth many exclamations of admiration from every one as she passed. She would not allow herself any more time to think. Her early, somewhat bohemian training had made her something of a fatalist. She felt that events would shape themselves, that the directing of them was not in her hands. From Chauvelin she knew that she could expect no mercy. He had set a price on Armand's head, and left it to her to pay or not, as she chose. Later on in the evening she caught sight of Sir Andrew Foulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst, who seemingly had just arrived. She noticed at once that Sir Andrew immediately made for little Suzanne de Tournay, and that the two young people soon managed to isolate themselves in one of the deep embrasures of the mullioned windows, there to carry on a long conversation, which seemed very earnest and very pleasant on both sides. Both the young men looked a little haggard and anxious, but otherwise they were irreproachably dressed, and there was not the slightest sign about their courtly demeanour of the terrible catastrophe which they must have felt hovering round them and round their chief. That the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel had no intention of abandoning its cause, she had gathered, through little Suzanne herself, who spoke openly of the assurance she and her mother had had that the Comte de Tournay would be rescued from France by the League within the next few days. Vaguely she began to wonder, as she looked at the brilliant and fashionable in the gaily lighted ballroom, which of these worldly men round her was the mysterious Scarlet Pimpernel, who held the threads of such daring plots, and the fate of valuable lives in his hands. A burning curiosity seized her to know him. 
although for months she had heard of him and had accepted his anonymity as every one else in society had done. But now she longed to know, quite impersonally, quite apart from Armand, and, oh, quite apart from Chauvelin, only for her own sake, for the sake of the enthusiastic admiration she had always bestowed on his bravery and cunning. He was at the ball, of course, somewhere, since Sir Andrew Foulkes and Lord Antony Dewhurst were here, evidently expecting to meet their chief, and perhaps to get a fresh mot d'ordre from him. Marguerite looked round at every one, at the aristocratic, high-typed Norman faces, the squarely built, fair-haired Saxon, the more gentle, humorous cast of the Celt, wondering which of these betrayed the power, the energy, the cunning, which had imposed its will and its leadership upon a number of high-born English gentlemen, among whom, rumour asserted, was His Royal Highness himself. Sir Andrew Foulkes? Surely not, with his gentle blue eyes, which were looking so tenderly and longingly after little Suzanne, who was being led away from the pleasant tête-à-tête -tête by her stern mother. Marguerite watched him across the room, as he finally turned away with a sigh, and seemed to stand, aimless and lonely, now that Suzanne's dainty little figure had disappeared in the crowd. She watched him as he strolled towards the doorway, which led to a small boudoir beyond, then paused and leaned against the framework of it, looking still anxiously all around him. Marguerite contrived for the moment to evade her present attentive cavalier, and she skirted the fashionable crowd, drawing nearer to the doorway against which Sir Andrew was leaning. Why she wished to get closer to him, she could not have said. Perhaps she was impelled by an all-powerful fatality, which so often seems to rule the destinies of men. Suddenly she stopped. Her very heart seemed to stand still, her eyes large and excited, flashed for a moment towards that doorway, then as quickly were turned away again. Sir Andrew Foulkes was still in the same listless position by the door, but Marguerite had distinctly seen that Lord Hastings, a young buck, a friend of her husband's and one of the princes said, had, as he quickly brushed past him, slipped something into his hand. For one moment longer—oh, it was the merest flash—Marguerite paused. The next she had, with admirably played unconcern, resumed her walk across the room, but this time more quickly, towards that doorway whence Sir Andrew had now disappeared. All this, from the moment that Marguerite had caught sight of Sir Andrew leaning against the doorway, until she followed him into the little boudoir beyond, had occurred in less than a minute. Fate is usually swift when she deals a blow. Now Lady Blakeney had suddenly ceased to exist. It was Marguerite St. Just who was there only. Marguerite St. Just, who had passed her childhood, her early youth, in the protecting arms of her brother Armand. She had forgotten everything else—her rank, her dignity, her secret enthusiasms everything save that our man stood in peril of his life, and that there, not twenty feet away from her, in the small boudoir which was quite deserted, in the very hands of Sir Andrew Foulkes, might be the talisman which would save her brother's life. Barely another thirty seconds had elapsed between the moment when Lord Hastings slipped the mysterious something into Sir Andrew's hand, and the one when she, in her turn, reached the deserted boudoir. Sir Andrew was standing with his back to her, and close to a table upon which stood a massive silver candelabra. A slip of paper was in his hand, and he was in the very act of perusing its contents. Unperceived, her soft clinging robe making not the slightest sound upon the heavy carpet, not daring to breathe until she had accomplished her purpose, Marguerite slipped close behind him. At that moment he looked round and saw her. She uttered a groan, passed her hand across her forehead, and murmured faintly, "'The heat in the room was terrible. I felt so faint. Oh!' She tottered almost as if she would fall, and Sir Andrew, quickly recovering himself and crumpling in his hand the tiny note he had been reading, was only apparently just in time to support her. "'You are ill, Lady Blakeney?' he asked with much concern. "'Let me—no, no, nothing,' she interrupted quickly. "'A chair, quick!' She sank into a chair close to the table, and, throwing back her head, closed her eyes. "'There,' she murmured still faintly, "'the giddiness is passing off. Do not heed me, Sir Andrew, I assure you, I already feel better.' At moments like these there is no doubt, and psychologists actually asserted, that there is in us a sense which has absolutely nothing to do with the other five. It is not that we see, it is not that we hear or touch, yet we seem to do all three at once. Marguerite sat there with her eyes apparently closed. Sir Andrew was immediately behind her, and on her right was the table with the five-armed candelabra upon it. Before her mental vision there was absolutely nothing but our man's face. Armand, whose life was in the most imminent danger, and who seemed to be looking at her from a background upon which were dimly painted the seething crowd of Paris, the bare walls of the Tribunal of Public Safety, with Fouquier-Tanville, the 
public prosecutor, demanding our man's life in the name of the people of France, and the lurid guillotine with its stained knife waiting for another victim. Armand. For one moment there was dead silence in the little boudoir. Beyond, from the brilliant ballroom, the sweet notes of the gavotte, the frou frou of rich dresses, the talk and laughter of a large and merry crowd, came as a strange, weird accompaniment to the drama which was being enacted here. Sir Andrew had not uttered another word. Then it was that that extra sense became potent in Marguerite Blakeney. She could not see, for her two eyes were closed. She could not hear, for the noise from the ballroom drowned the soft rustle of that momentous scrap of paper. Nevertheless, she knew, as if she had both seen and heard, that Sir Andrew was even now holding the paper to the flame of one of the candles. At the exact moment that it began to catch fire, she opened her eyes, raised her hand, and, with two dainty fingers, had taken the burning scrap of paper from the young man's hand. Then she blew out the flame, and held the paper to her nostril with perfect unconcern. "'How thoughtful of you, Sir Andrew,' she said gaily. "'Surely it was your grandmother who taught you that the smell of burnt paper was a sovereign remedy against giddiness.' She sighed with satisfaction, holding the paper tightly between her jewelled fingers. That talisman which, perhaps, would save her brother Armand's life. Sir Andrew was staring at her too dazed for the moment to realise what had actually happened. He had been taken so completely by surprise that he seemed quite unable to grasp the fact that the slip of paper which she held in her dainty hand was one, perhaps, on which the life of his comrade might depend. Marguerite burst into a long, merry peal of laughter. "'Why do you stare at me like that?' she said playfully. "'I assure you I feel much better. Your remedy has proved most effectual. This room is most delightedly cool,' she added, with the same perfect composure and the sound of the gavotte from the ballroom is fascinating and soothing. She was prattling on in the most unconcerned and pleasant way, whilst Sir Andrew, in an agony of mind, was racking his brains as to the quickest method he could employ to get that bit of paper out of that beautiful woman's hand. Instinctively, vague and tumultuous thoughts rushed through his mind. He suddenly remembered her nationality, and, worst of all, recollected that horrible tale in the Marquis de Saint-Cyr, which in England no one had credited, for the sake of Sir Percy as well as for her own. What? "'Still dreaming and staring?' she said with a merry laugh. "'You are most ungallant, Sir Andrew. And now I come to think of it, you seemed more startled than pleased when you saw me just now. I do believe, after all, that it was not concern for my health, nor yet a remedy taught you by your grandmother that caused you to burn this tiny scrap of paper. I vow it must have been your Lady Love's last cruel epistle you were trying to destroy. Now confess,' she added, playfully holding up the scrap of paper, "'does this contain her final congé?' or a last appeal to kiss and make friends. "'Whichever it is, Lady Blakeney,' said Sir Andrew, who was gradually recovering his self-possession, "'this little note is undoubtedly mine, and—' Not caring whether his action was one that would be styled ill-bred towards a lady, the young man had made a bold dash for the note. But Marguerite's thoughts flew quicker than his own. Her actions under pressure of his intense excitement were swifter and more sure. She was tall and strong. She took a quick step backwards, and knocked over the small Sheraton table, which was already top-heavy, and which fell down with a crash, together with the massive candelabra upon it. She gave a quick cry of alarm. "'The candle, Sir Andrew! Quick!' There was not much damage done. One or two of the candles had blown out as the candelabra fell. Others had merely sent some grease upon the valuable carpet. One had ignited the paper-shade over it. Sir Andrew quickly and dexterously put out the flames, and replaced the candelabra upon the table. But this had taken him a few seconds to do— and those seconds had been all that Marguerite needed to cast a quick glance at the paper, and to note its contents. A dozen words in the same distorted handwriting she had seen before, and bearing the same device, a star-shaped flower drawn in red ink. When Sir Andrew once more looked at her, he saw only upon her face alarm at the untoward accident and relief at its happy issue, whilst the tiny and momentous note had apparently fluttered to the ground. Eagerly the young man picked it up, and his face looked much relieved, as his fingers closed tightly over it. "'For shame, Sir Andrew,' she said, shaking her head with a playful sigh, "'making havoc in the heart of some impressionable duchess, whilst conquering the affections of my sweet little Suzanne. "'Well, well, I do believe it was Cupid himself who stood by you, and threatened the entire foreign office with the destruction by fire, just on purpose to make me drop love's message, before it had been polluted by my indiscreet eyes.' to think that a moment longer, and I might have known the secrets of an erring duchess. "'You will forgive me, Lady Blakeney,' said Sir Andrew, now as calm as she was herself, "'if I resume the interesting occupation which you have interrupted?' "'By all means, Sir Andrew. How should I venture to thwart the love-god again? Perhaps he would mete out some terrible chastisement against my presumption. Burn your love-token, by all means.' 
Sir Andrew had already twisted the paper into a long spill, and was once again holding it to the flame of the candle which had remained alight. He did not notice the strange smile on the face of his fair vis a vis, so intent was he on the work of destruction. Perhaps, had he done so, the look of relief would have faded from his face. He watched the fateful note as it curled under the flame. Soon the last fragment fell on the floor, and he placed his heel upon the ashes. And now, Sir Andrew, said Marguerite Blakeney, with the pretty nonchalance peculiar to herself, and with the most winning of smiles, will you venture to excite the jealousy of your fair lady by asking me to dance the nuet? End of chapter twelve. The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzee. Chapter thirteen. Either or. The few words which Marguerite Blakeney had managed to read on the half scorched piece of paper seemed literally to be the words of fate. Start myself to morrow. This she had read quite distinctly. Then came a blur caused by the smoke of the candle, which obliterated the next few words. But right at the bottom there was another sentence like letters of fire before her mental vision. If you wish to speak to me again, I shall be in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. The whole was signed with the hastily scrawled little device, a tiny star shaped flower which had become so familiar to her. One o'clock precisely. It was now close upon eleven. The last minuet was being danced, with Sir Andrew Folkes and beautiful Lady Blakeney leading the couples through its delicate and intricate figures. Close upon eleven. The hands of the handsome Louis XV clock upon its ormolu bracket seemed to move along with maddening rapidity. Two hours more, and her fate and that of Armand would be sealed. In two hours she must make up her mind whether she will keep the knowledge so cunningly gained to herself, and leave her brother to his fate or whether she will wilfully betray a brave man whose life was devoted to his fellow men, who was noble, generous, and above all unsuspecting. It seemed a horrible thing to do. But then there was Armand. Armand too was noble and brave. Armand too was unsuspecting. And Armand loved her, would have willingly trusted his life in her hands, and now, when she could save him from death, she hesitated. Oh, it was monstrous! Her brother's kind, gentle face, so full of love for her, seemed to be looking reproachfully at her. "'You might have saved me, Margot,' he seemed to say to her, "'and you chose the life of a stranger, a man you do not know, whom you have never seen, and preferred that he should be safe, whilst you sent me to the guillotine.' All these conflicting thoughts raged through Marguerite's brain, while, with a smile upon her lips, she glided through the graceful mazes of the minuet. She noted, with that acute sense of hers, that she had succeeded in completely allaying Sir Andrew's fears. Her self-control had been absolutely perfect. She was a finer actress at this moment, and through the whole of this minuet, than she had ever been upon the boards of the Comédie Française. But then a beloved brother's life had not depended upon her histrionic powers. She was too clever to overdo her part, and made no further allusions to the supposed billet doux, which had caused Sir Andrew Folk such an agonizing five minutes. She watched his anxiety melting away under her sunny smile, and soon perceived that, whatever doubt may have crossed his mind at the moment, she had, by the time the last bars of the minuet had been played, succeeded in completely dispelling it. He never realized in what a fever of excitement she was, what effort it cost her to keep up a constant ripple of banal conversation. When the minuet was over, she asked Sir Andrew to take her into the next room. "'I have promised to go down to supper with His Royal Highness,' she said. But before we part, tell me, am I forgiven? Forgiven? Yes, confess, I gave you a fright just now. But remember, I am not an Englishwoman, and I do not look upon the exchanging of a billet doux as a crime, and I vow I'll not tell my little Suzanne. But now tell me, shall I welcome you at my water-party on Wednesday? I am not sure, Lady Blakeney, he replied evasively. I may have to leave London to-morrow. I would not do that if I were you, she said earnestly. Then, seeing the anxious look reappearing in his eyes, she added gaily, "'No one can throw a ball better than you can, Sir Andrew. We should so miss you on the bowling green.' He had led her across the room, to one beyond, where already His Royal Highness was waiting for the beautiful Lady Blakeney. "'Madame, supper awaits us,' said the Prince, offering his arm to Marguerite, "'and I am full of hope. The goddess Fortune has frowned so persistently on me at hazard, that I look with confidence for the smiles of the goddess of beauty.' "'Your Highness has been unfortunate at the card-tables?' asked Marguerite, as she took the Prince's arm. "'Aye, most unfortunate. 
Blakeney, not content with being the richest among my father's subjects, has also the most outrageous luck. By the way, where is that inimitable wit? I vow, madam, that this life would be but a dreary desert without your smiles and his sallies. End of chapter 13《The Scarlet Pimpernel》by Baroness Orzy. Chapter fourteen. One o'clock precisely. Supper had been extremely gay. All those present declared that never had Lady Blakeney been more adorable, nor that demmed idiot Sir Percy more amusing. His Royal Highness had laughed until the tears streamed down his cheeks at Blakeney's foolish yet funny repartees. His doggerel verse, "We seek him here, we seek him there," etc., was sung to the tune of "Ho, merry Britons," and to the accompaniment of glasses knocked loudly against the table. Lord Grenville, moreover, had a most perfect cook. Some wags asserted that he was a scion of the old French noblesse, who, having lost his fortune, had come to seek it in the cuisine of the Foreign Office. Marguerite Blakeney was in her most brilliant mood, and surely not a soul in that crowded supper room had even an inkling of the terrible struggle which was raging within her heart. The clock was ticking so mercilessly on; it was long past midnight, and even the Prince of Wales was thinking of leaving the supper table. Within the next half hour, the destinies of two brave men would be pitted against one another: the dearly beloved brother, and he, the unknown hero. Marguerite had not tried to see Chauvelin during this last hour. She knew that his keen, fox-like eyes would terrify her at once, and incline the balance of her decision towards Armand. Whilst she did not see him, there still lingered in her heart of hearts a vague, undefined hope that something would occur, something big, enormous, epoch-making, which would shift from her young, weak shoulders this terrible burden of responsibility, of having to choose between two such cruel alternatives. But the minutes ticked on with that dull monotony which they invariably seem to assume when our very nerves ache with their incessant ticking. After supper, dancing was resumed. His Royal Highness had left, and there was general talk of departing among the older guests. The young were indefatigable and had started on a new gavotte, which would fill the next quarter of an hour. Marguerite did not feel equal to another dance. There is a limit to the most enduring of self-control. Escorted by a cabinet minister, she had once more found her way to the tiny boudoir, still the most deserted among all the rooms. She knew that Chauvelin must be lying in wait for her somewhere, ready to seize the first possible opportunity for a tête-à-tête. -tête. His eyes had met hers for a moment after the four supper minuet, and she knew that the keen diplomat, with those searching pale eyes of his, had divined that her work had been accomplished. Fate had willed it so. Marguerite, torn by the most terrible conflict heart of woman can ever know. Had resigned herself to its decrees, but Armand must be saved at any cost. He first of all, for he was her brother, had been mother, father, friend to her ever since she, a tiny babe, had lost both her parents. To think of Armand dying a traitor's death on the guillotine was too horrible even to dwell upon, impossible in fact. That could never be, never. As for the stranger, the hero. Well. There let fate decide. Marguerite would redeem her brother's life at the hands of the relentless enemy. Then let that cunning Scarlet Pimpernel extricate himself after that. Perhaps vaguely, Marguerite hoped that the daring plotter, who for so many months had baffled an army of spies, would still manage to evade Chauvelin and remain immune to the end. She thought of all this as she sat listening to the witty discourse of the cabinet minister, who no doubt felt that he had found in Lady Blakeney a most perfect listener. Suddenly she saw the keen, fox-like face of Chauvelin peeping through the curtained doorway. "Lord Fancourt," she said to the minister, "will you do me a service?" "I am entirely at your ladyship's service," he replied gallantly. "Will you see if my husband is still in the card room? And if he is, will you tell him that I am very tired and would be glad to go home soon?" The commands of a beautiful woman are binding on all mankind, even on cabinet ministers. Lord Fancourt prepared to obey instantly. "I do not like to leave your ladyship alone." He said, "Never fear. I shall be quite safe here, and I think undisturbed. But I am really tired. You know, Sir Percy will drive back to Richmond. It is a long way, and we shall not, and we do not hurry, get home before daybreak." Lord Fancourt had perforce to go. The moment he had disappeared, Chauvelin slipped into the room, and the next instant stood calm and impassive by her side. "You have news for me?" he said. 
An icy mantle seemed to have suddenly settled round Marguerite's shoulders, though her cheeks glowed with fire. She felt chilled and numbed. Oh, Armand, will you ever know the terrible sacrifice of pride, of dignity, of womanliness a devoted sister is making for your sake? Nothing of importance, she said, staring mechanically before her. But it might prove a clue. I contrived, no matter how, to detect Sir Andrew Folkes in the very act of burning a paper at one of these candles. In this very room. That paper I succeeded in holding between my fingers for the space of two minutes, and to cast my eyes on it for that of ten seconds. Time enough to learn its contents? asked Chauvelin quietly. She nodded, then continued in the same even, mechanical tone of voice. In the corner of the paper there was the usual rough device of a small star shaped flower. Above it I read two lines. Everything else was scorched and blackened by the flame. And what were the two lines? Her throat seemed suddenly to have contracted. For an instant she felt that she could not speak the words which might send a brave man to his death. It is lucky that the whole paper was not burned, added Chauvelin with dry sarcasm, for it might have fared ill with Armand Saint Just. What were the two lines, citoyenne? One was, I start myself to morrow, she said quietly. The other, if you wish to speak to me, I shall be in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. Chauvelin looked up at the clock just above the mantelpiece. Then I have plenty of time, he said placidly. What are you going to do? she asked. She was pale as a statue, her hands were icy cold, her head and heart throbbed with the awful strain upon her nerves. Oh, this was cruel, cruel! What had she done to have deserved all this? Her choice was made. Had she done a vile action, or one that was sublime? The recording angel who writes in the Book of Gold. Alone could give an answer. What are you going to do? she repeated mechanically. Oh, nothing for the present. After that, it will depend. On what? On whom I shall see in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. You will see the Scarlet Pimpernel, of course. But you do not know him. No. But I shall presently. Sir Andrew will have warned him. I think not. When you parted from him after the minuet, he stood and watched you for a moment or two. With a look which gave me to understand that something had happened between you. It was only natural, was it not, that I should make a shrewd guess as to the nature of that something? I thereupon engaged the young man in a long and animated conversation. We discussed Herr Gluck's singular success in London, until a lady claimed his arm for supper. Since then? I did not lose sight of him through supper. When we all came upstairs again, Lady Portals buttoned hold him and started on the subject of pretty Mademoiselle Suzanne de Tournay. I knew he would not move until Lady Portals had exhausted on the subject, which will not be for another quarter of an hour at least, and it is five minutes to one now. He was preparing to go, and went up to the doorway where, drawing aside the curtain, he stood for a moment pointing out to Marguerite the distant figure of Sir Andrew Folkes in close conversation with Lady Portals. I think, he said with a triumphant smile, that I may safely expect to find the person I seek in the dining room, fair lady. There may be more than one. Whoever is there, as the clock strikes one, will be shadowed by one of my men. Of these, one, or perhaps two, or even three, will leave for France to morrow. One of these will be the Scarlet Pimpernel. Yes. And? I also, fair lady, will leave for France to morrow. The papers found at Dover upon the person of Sir Andrew Folkes speak of the neighbourhood of Calais, of an inn which I know well, called Le Chagri, of a lonely place somewhere on the coast, the Père Blanchard's hut which I must endeavour to find. All these places are given as the point where this meddlesome Englishman has bidden the traitor de Dornay and others to meet his emissaries. But it seems that he has decided not to send his emissaries, that he will start himself to-morrow. Now one of these persons, whom I shall see anon in the supper-room, will be journeying to Calais, and I shall follow that person, until I have tracked him to where those fugitive aristocrats await him. For that person, fair lady, will be the man whom I have sought for— for nearly a year, the man whose energies has outdone me, whose ingenuity has baffled me, whose audacity has set me wandering, yes, me, who have seen a trick or two in my time, the mysterious and elusive Scarlet Pimpernel. And Armand, she pleaded, have I ever broken my word? I promise you that the day the Scarlet Pimpernel and I start for France, I will send you that imprudent letter of his by special courier. More than that, I will pledge you the word of France, that the day I lay hands on that meddlesome Englishman, Saint-Just will be here in England, safe in the arms of his charming sister. 
and with a deep and elaborate bow, and another look at the clock, Chauvelin glided out of the room. It seemed to Marguerite that through all the noise, all the din of music, dancing, and laughter, she could hear his cat-like tread gliding through the vast reception rooms, that she could hear him go down the massive staircase, reach the dining room, and open the door. Fate had decided, had made her speak, had made her do a vile and abominable thing for the sake of the brother she loved. She lay back in her chair, passive and still, seeing the figure of her relentless enemy ever present before her aching eyes. When Chauvelin reached the supper room, it was quite deserted. It had that woe-begone, forsaken, tawdry appearance, which reminds one so much of a ball dress the morning after. Half-empty glasses littered the table, unfolded napkins lay about, the chairs turned towards one another in groups of twos and threes, very close to one another, in the far corners of the room, which spoke of recent whispered flirtations, of a cold game-pie and champagne. There were sets of three and four chairs that recalled pleasant, animated discussions over the latest scandal. There were chairs straight up in a row that still looked starchy, critical, acid, like antiquated dowager. There were a few isolated single chairs close to the table that spoke of gourmands intent on the most recherche dishes, and others overturned on the floor that spoke volumes on the subject of my Lord Grenville's cellars. It was a ghost-like replica, in fact, of that fashionable gathering upstairs, a ghost that haunts every house where balls and good suppers are given, a picture drawn with white chalk on grey cardboard, dull and colourless, now that the bright silk dresses and gorgeously embroidered coats were no longer there to fill in the foreground, and now that the candles flickered sleepily in their sockets. Chauvelin smiled benignly, and rubbing his long, thin hands together, he looked round the deserted supper-room, whence even the last flunky had retired in order to join his friends in the hall below. All was silence in the dimly lighted room, whilst the sound of the gavotte, the hum of distant talk and laughter, the rumble of an occasional coach outside, only seemed to reach this palace of the sleeping beauty as the murmur of some flitting spooks far away. It all looked so peaceful, so luxurious, and so still, that the keenest observer, a veritable prophet, could never have guessed that, at this present moment, that deserted supper-room was nothing but a trap laid for the capture of the most cunning and audacious plotter those stirring times had ever seen. Chauvelin pondered, and tried to peer into the immediate future. What would this man be like, whom he and the leaders of the whole revolution had sworn to bring to his death? Everything about him was weird and mysterious. His personality, which he so cunningly concealed, the power he wielded over nineteen English gentlemen, who seemed to obey his every command blindly and enthusiastically, the passionate love and submission he had roused in his little trained band, and, above all, his marvellous audacity, the boundless impudence which had caused him to beard his most implacable enemies within the very walls of Paris. No wonder that in France the sobriquet of the mysterious Englishman roused in the people a superstitious shudder. Chauvelin himself, as he gazed around the deserted room, where presently the weird hero would appear, felt a strange feeling of awe creeping all down his spine. But his plans were well laid. He felt sure that the Scarlet Pimpernel had not been warned, and felt equally sure that Marguerite Blakeney had not played him false. If she had, a cruel look that would have made her shudder gleamed in Chauvelin's keen, pale eyes. If she had played him a trick, Armand Saint-Just would suffer the extreme penalty. But no, no, of course she had not played him false. Fortunately, the supper-room was deserted. This would make Chauvelin's task all the easier, when presently that unsuspecting enigma would enter it alone. No one was here now save Chauvelin himself. Stay. As he surveyed with a satisfied smile the solitude of the room, the cunning agent of the French government became aware of the peaceful, monotonous breathing of some one of my Lord Grenville's guests, who, no doubt— had supped both wisely and well, and was enjoying a quiet sleep, away from the din of the dancing above. Chauvelin looked round once more, and there, in the corner of a sofa, in the dark angle of the room, his mouth open, his eyes shut, the sweet sounds of peaceful slumbers proceeding from his nostrils, reclined the gorgeously apparelled, long-limbed husband of the cleverest woman in Europe. Chauvelin looked at him as he lay there, placid, unconscious, at peace with all the world and himself, after the best of suppers, and a smile that was almost one of pity softened for a moment the hard lines of the Frenchman's face, and the sarcastic twinkle of his pale eyes. Evidently the slumberer, deep in dreamless sleep, would not interfere with Chauvelin's trap for catching that cunning scarlet pimpernel, 
Again he rubbed his hands together, and following the example of Sir Percy Blakeney, he too stretched himself out in the corner of another sofa, shut his eyes, opened his mouth, gave forth sounds of peaceful breathing, and waited. End of chapter 14. The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzy. Chapter 15 Doubt. Marguerite Blakeney had watched the slight, sable clad figure of Chauvelin as he worked his way through the ballroom. Then, perforce, she had had to wait while her nerves tingled with excitement. Listlessly she sat in the small, still deserted boudoir, looking out through the curtained doorway on the dancing couples beyond, looking at them, yet seeing nothing, hearing the music, yet conscious of naught save a feeling of expectancy, of anxious, weary waiting. Her mind conjured up before her the vision of what was, perhaps at this very moment, passing downstairs. The half-deserted dining-room, the fateful hour, Chauvelin on the watch. Then, precise to the moment, the entrance of a man, he, the Scarlet Pimpernel, the mysterious leader who, to Marguerite, had become almost unreal. So strange, so weird was this hidden identity. She wished she were in the supper-room, too, at this moment watching him as he entered. She knew that her woman's penetration would at once recognise in the stranger's face, whoever he might be, that strong individuality which belongs to a leader of men, to a hero, to the mighty, high-soaring eagle whose daring wings were becoming entangled in the ferret's trap. Woman-like, she thought of him with unmixed sadness. The irony of that fate seemed so cruel which allowed the fearless lion to succumb to the gnawing of a rat. Had our man's life not been at stake? "'Faith, your ladyship must have thought me very remiss,' said a voice suddenly close to her elbow. "'I had a deal of difficulty in delivering your message, for I could not find Blakeney anywhere at first. Marguerite had forgotten all about her husband and her message to him. His very name, as spoken by Lord Fancourt, sounded strange and unfamiliar to her, so completely had she, in the last five minutes, lived her old life in the Rue de Richelieu again, with Armand always near her to love and protect her, to guard her from the many subtle intrigues which were for ever raging in Paris in those days. "'I did find him at last,' continued Lord Fancourt, "'and gave him your message.' He said that he would give orders at once for the horses to be put to. Ah, she said, still very absently, you found my husband and gave him my message. Yes, he was in the dining-room, fast asleep. I could not manage to wake him up at first. Thank you very much, she said mechanically, trying to collect her thoughts. Will your ladyship honour me with the contredance until your coach is ready? asked Lord Fancourt. No, I thank you, my lord, but—and you will forgive me— I really am too tired, and the heat in the ballroom has become oppressive. The conservatory is deliciously cool. Let me take you there, and then get you something. You seem ailing, Lady Blakeney. I am only very tired," she repeated wearily, as she allowed Lord Fancourt to lead her, where subdued lights and green plants lent coolness to the air. He got her a chair, into which she sank. This long interval of waiting was intolerable. Why did not Chauvelin come and tell her the result of his watch? Lord Fancourt was very attentive. She scarcely heard what he said, and suddenly startled him by asking abruptly, "'Lord Fancourt, did you perceive who was in the dining-room just now besides Sir Percy Blakeney?' "'Only the agent of the French government, Monsieur Chauvelin, equally fast asleep in another corner,' he said. "'Why does your ladyship ask?' "'I know not. I—' "'Did you notice the time when you were there?' "'It must have been about five or ten minutes past one. I wonder what your ladyship is thinking about.' he added, for evidently the fair lady's thoughts were very far away, and she had not been listening to his intellectual conversation. But, indeed, her thoughts were not very far away. Only one story below, in this same house, in the dining-room where sat Chauvelin still on the watch. Had he failed? For one instant that possibility rose before as a hope, the hope that the Scarlet Pimpernel had been warned by Sir Andrew, and that Chauvelin's trap had failed to catch his bird. But that hope soon gave way to fear. Had he failed? But then, Armand— Lord Fancourt had given up talking, since he found that he had no listener. He wanted an opportunity for slipping away, for sitting opposite to a lady, however fair, who is evidently not heeding the most vigorous efforts made for her entertainment, is not exhilarating, even to a cabinet-minister. 
"'Shall I find out if your ladyship's coach is ready?' he said at last, tentatively. "'Oh, thank you. Thank you, if you would be so kind. I fear I am but sorry company, but I am really tired, and perhaps would be best alone.' But Lord Fancourt went, and still Chauvelin did not come. Oh, what had happened! She felt Armand's fate trembling in the balance. She feared, now with a deadly fear, that Chauvelin had failed, and that the mysterious Scarlet Pimpernel had proved elusive once more. Then she knew that she need hope for no pity, no mercy from him. He had pronounced his either or, and nothing less would content him. He was very spiteful, and would affect the belief that she had wilfully misled him, and having failed to trap the eagle once again, his revengeful mind would be content with the humble prey. Armand! Yet she had done her best, had strained every nerve for Armand's sake. She could not bear to think that all had failed. She could not sit still. She wanted to go and hear the worst at once. She wondered even that Chauvelin had not come yet to vent his wrath and satire upon her. Lord Grenville himself came presently to tell her that her coach was ready, and that Sir Percy was already waiting for her, ribbons in hand. Marguerite said farewell to her distinguished host. Many of her friends stopped her as she crossed the rooms, to talk to her and exchange pleasant au revoirs. The minister only took final leave of beautiful Lady Blakeney on the top of the stairs. Below, on the landing, a veritable army of gallant gentlemen were waiting to bid good-bye to the Queen of Beauty and Fashion, whilst outside, under the massive portico, Sir Percy's magnificent bays were impatient, pawing the ground. At the top of the stairs, just after she had taken final leave of her host, she suddenly saw Chauvelin. He was coming up the stairs slowly, and rubbing his thin hands very softly together. There was a curious look on his mobile face, partly amused, and wholly puzzled. As his keen eyes met Marguerite's, they became strangely sarcastic. "'Monsieur Chauvelin,' she said, as he stopped on the top of the stairs, bowing elaborately before her, "'my coach is outside. May I claim your arm?' As gallant as ever, he offered her his arm, and led her downstairs. The crowd was very great. Some of the minister's guests were departing, others were leaning against the banisters, watching the throng as it filed up and down the wide staircase. Chauvelin, she said at last desperately, I must know what has happened. What has happened, dear lady? he said, with affected surprise. Where? When? You are torturing me, Chauvelin. I have helped you to night. Surely I have the right to know. What happened in the dining room at one o'clock just now? She spoke in a whisper trusting that in the general hubbub of the crowd her words would remain unheeded by all, save the man at her side. Quiet and peace reigned supreme, fair lady. At that hour I was asleep in one corner of one sofa, and Sir Percy Blakeney in another. Nobody came into the room at all? Nobody. Then we have failed, you and I? Yes, we have failed. Perhaps. But Armand? she pleaded. Ah! Armand Saint Just's chances hang on a thread. Pray heaven, dear lady, that that thread may not snap. Chauvelin, I worked for you sincerely, earnestly. Remember, I remember my promise. He said quietly, "The day that the Scarlet Pimpernel and I meet on French soil, Saint Just will be in the arms of his charming sister, which means that a brave man's blood will be on my hands." She said with a shudder, "His blood or that of your brother." Surely, at the present moment, you must hope, as I do, that the enigmatical Scarlet Pimpernel will start for Calais to-day. I am only conscious of one hope, citoyen, and that is, that Satan, your master, will have need of you elsewhere before the sun rises to-day. You flatter me, citoyen. She had detained him for a while, midway down the stairs, trying to get at the thoughts which lay beyond that thin, fox-like mask. But Chauvelin remained urbane, sarcastic, mysterious. Not a line betrayed to the poor, anxious woman whether she need fear, or whether she dared to hope. Downstairs on the landing she was soon surrounded. Lady Blakeney never stepped from any house into her coach, without an escort of fluttering human moths around the dazzling light of her beauty. But before she finally turned away from Chauvelin, she held out a tiny hand to him, with that pretty gesture of childish appeal, which was essentially her own. "'Give me some hope, my little Chauvelin,' she pleaded. With perfect gallantry he bowed over that tiny hand, which looked so dainty and white through the delicately transparent black lace mitten, and kissing the tips of the rosy fingers, "'Pray heaven that the thread may not snap,' he repeated, with his enigmatic smile. 
and, stepping aside, he allowed the moths to flutter more closely round the candle, and the brilliant throng of the jeunesse dorée, eagerly attentive to Lady Blakeney's every movement, hid the keen, fox-like face from her view. End of chapter 15